you move every meeting just to test me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I just was double checking. Administrative Services Director, Angela Quarter, and our Director of Community Development, Noah Hausch. And I see another person sitting back there, but I don't know her. Excellent. Thank you very much. And of course, our city clerk, Lauren Burgess. All right, if I could have um, everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, thank you all very much for that. We're now at item four, which is approval of minutes and notice of waiving and reading of all resolutions and ordinances introduced and or adopted under this agenda. And we are looking to approve the regular meeting minutes from October 8. So moved. What second. Motion is second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions, please show a four zero and one vote on that. All right, we are now at item five, which are the announcements. Meeting orientation for new attendees and viewers. In conformance with the Brown Act and the adopted city council rules, the meeting agenda includes items labeled as action items where the city council will consider the item and citizens are afforded the opportunity to provide comments relevant to the item being discussed. The meeting agenda also includes a citizen's business item, which is the designated place on the agenda where citizens have the right to say whatever they wish. The council may or may not choose to respond to comments as the government code allows. However, if the city council declines to respond, it should not be perceived as giving credence to or agreeing with any statements that the city council or its members believe are incorrect, misinformed, or purposefully biased. By the way, I want to check. We did have some microphone issues at our last meeting. Can everybody hear out there? It's all good? Okay, great. The City Katadi has special open office hours on Monday evenings from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. by appointment in the Community Development Department at City Hall as part of its Katadi Open for Business program. This program provides personalized assistance and information to developers, current Katadi business owners, and those interested in starting a new business within the city. The Roner Park Katadi Regional Library hosts events for all ages, including art exhibits, book clubs, and children's programs. All events are free and open to the public. For more information, call the library at 584-9121 or visit sonomalibrary.org. The Katadi Historical Society Museum is open regularly the second Tuesday of each month from 5 to 7 p.m., Saturdays from 1 to 4 p.m., and by appointment. For more information, call 794-0305. Citizens interested in receiving City of Katadi community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up at nixel.com or by texting your zip code 94931 to 888-777. And finally, Measure G supports police services, a variety of recreation programs for all ages, and the maintenance of our streets, parks, and public buildings. See details on the web at katadicity.org. And we will now move to item six, which is approval of final agenda. Do we have any changes? Thank you, Mayor. No proposed changes. No changes. Very good. Thank you. All right. Sorry? Thank God. Okay. okay. And we're now at item seven, which is citizens' business and public comment for consent calendar items. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on any item listed on the consent calendar or any matter not listed on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any item not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to City Council Policy 2017-02, comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes in length per person for matters not on the agenda and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. The mayor may extend the time limit for a reasonable time where a disability accommodation has been requested. 
And we sometimes get speaker cards, we sometimes don't, but I do have a speaker cards for Mr. Barrett, so please, if you'd like to come up and address us. Yes, Mayor, it's uh, Councilman Barrett, as I said on the speaker card, but you refuse to call me as Councilman Barrett because you're petty political BS here at these meetings. So I'd like you to grow up and read the speaker cards and stop playing politics. I'd like to welcome everybody to the council meeting tonight. I'm Councilman George Barrett. I'm a former councilman here. And um, at the last meeting, it was not your microphone that wasn't working, Mayor. It was this microphone here that was not working. So stop playing games. It took Lori Alderman to have to come up here and beg you that the microphone was not working and she had to sit down before you would call a recess. So quit lying about the facts. It's all on tape. It wasn't until she wanted to sit down because nobody could hear her in the room that you decided to take your recess. And I'm very disappointed in Susan Harvey who's not here tonight because she sat right next to you and could see my speaker card on the counter and was smiling at you because you were playing games with the speaker cards. Then you have Mr. Lamb in here who won't shut up and let you run the meeting trying to tell everybody, well, I can hear, I can hear everybody fine. I can hear everybody fine. You're the mayor. You're not. And at least John Moore has learned how to shut up and let the mayor run the meeting. And I applaud him for that. And how dare the mayor give me three, uh, appear to give me three minutes to speak and tell me he will shut my microphone off because I have exposed his hatred, his intolerance, and his political game playing. This is why so many people in this town refer to this council as Soviets and fascists. By your conduct and misconduct at the last meeting, evidently you didn't take the federal judge's advice and go back to school on the First Amendment that he said from the bench. Frankly, I don't know any liberal attorney other than Wendy Skillman who can remain silent witnessing my free speech rights violated as was done here at the last city council meeting by the mayor. Now you people need a time out and owe the community an apology for your conduct and misconduct at the last meeting and your constant violations of the Brown Act. They're constant. The fascists always want to control everything, including our free speech. And you did a great job about, about it last, last uh, meeting. Your incompetency and complete disdain for the First Amendment is horrifying. Don't be fascist. Thank you very much for your comments. Is there anyone else? Ms. Alderman. Um, I want to make sure that people out there in TV land, if I'm green and you can't hear me, that's just what we had last night, so please call in or do something because the Planning Commission was green and had no sound for the whole meeting. And um, you were, George, Councilman Barrick is right that you guys were out of line last week, last May meeting on the it was indescribable. You're under a federal lawsuit for me for First Amendment rights. And it doesn't change your behavior one bit. You'll do anything to make sure. There is only, as usual, George and I here representing citizens. The rest of the people in the room are developers and the fire marshal. You've driven everyone away. You take everybody's comments no matter what, and you discuss them throughout. You degrade us throughout. Not You break the Brown Act because you sit there and talk about things that we talk about later and degrade us. That's what part of the lawsuit is about. Then you have meetings like tonight. 508 pages of an agenda. You guys did har had hardly anything. And we know everything is going to pass. The last, se I, in July I did the count, 717 approvals. 710 were unanimous. We have no voice. It's not, it doesn't matter. You guys can do whatever the hell you want because we're not, this is not a democracy anymore. You can have people, there was two people 
at the planning commission on the uh, memory care ones for both meetings. You're still proceeding it, it. You don't do what you're supposed to or you do with the minimal, the legal minimal standard and you could get away with it. And you have, and it's, this is going to come back and bite you guys that you're, you know, the federal judge is going to come down on all of you guys. It's, it's happen, going to happening. And meanwhile, you won't even put us things like weed abatement on the, on the, um, just so the developer knows they haven't, it's in the city code. They haven't, um, enforced the weed abatement code for seven years now that is in the city code. You know, they, they, they also don't give a, anything about a homeless, a friend, a friend from high school just was killed in Santa Rosa for sleeping in her car. You know, there's, there is a lot that needs to be done and not just your agenda. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in, under citizen's business? I had seen no one. I will go ahead and close that. And we're now at item eight, which is, and I'm sorry, but did either of you have comments for consent? No. no. All right. So item eight is the consent calendar. We have three items, A, B, and C, and I'm looking for direction or a motion. Move to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Nope. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? abstentions please show 401 vote on that to move it forward and do any council members have any direction for future agenda items i'll start to my right council member no vice mayor no thank you council one member. small one yes uh this could be an agenda item or it might be just probably a report out i think at uh, at, a, at a city manager's report but i wonder if we could have an update on the status of the wooden benches for the northern gateway project uh, they're a little behind schedule with some questions about that. I know there were some changes to the design. And since we're a little behind, some people have asked if we could have an update. I think that would be valuable for the public. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you. And I as well have nothing um, for future agenda items right now. All right, we're now under the public hearing section. We're on uh, item 10A. And this is consideration of an ordinance and resolutions proposing adoption and approval of a mitigated negative declaration, zoning code text amendment, preliminary design review, use permit and lot line adjustment to allow construction of a new 77,000 square foot assisted living facility with 88 units, a 24,100 square foot memory care facility with 34 units, and a 4,000 square foot commercial building located in the commercial Gravenstein Corridor zoning district on two unaddressed parcels located at the northwest corner of Alder Avenue and State Route 116. Mr. Housh, I believe this is yours. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, as identified, the item before the Council is a consideration of an ordinance uh, and resolutions to adopt and approve uh, initial study mitigated negative declaration, design review, use permit, lot line adjustments, and a zoning code text amendment. Uh, which would allow the construction of a 77,000 square foot assisted living facility as identified by the mayor, a uh, 24,000 square foot memory care facility and a 4,000 square foot retail building. The project design also includes ancillary and supporting elements uh, in the site plan. Uh, as also identified, the site's located on the corner of Alder and State Highway 116, two unaddressed parcels uh, represented here with the red star. Uh, the site totals 5.6 acres and is designated um, general commercial by the general plan and is zoned consistent with that designation. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of the site highlighted here, uh, just identifying uh, the previous or the existing development which was previously occupied by Red's recovery room. Uh, and then there's a, a single family home also on the site further to the north. This slide identifies an uh, essentially the proposed development overlaid onto the aerial photograph. So the buildings are identified in blue, the uh, darker black lines identify the parking areas and there's some stormwater detention facilities located within the parking lot. Uh, it's harder to see in this slide, but there are also green areas identifying the proposed um, uh, dedications of right-of-way, which would accommodate the <clears throat> circulation elements as identified in the general plan. 
And then the hash marks along the southern portion of the, uh, the slide there, which are in the 116 right away, identify the, the ballpark area of the proposed frontage improvements, which do include sidewalk, uh, planter strip, and the typical uh, standards um, requirements that are uh, developed along with additional properties. Um, these are some renderings which the developer applicant has also brought there on the, um, uh, the color boards. This is seen from Alder Avenue at the entrance to the site. This is the 116 Frontage Avenue rendering. And then this is uh, kind of a rendering further west on 116 looking back at the proposed commercial building. As identified in the staff report, the project does comply with numerous general plan standards and policies. As is further identified, the proposed design is in keeping with the zoning criteria uh, for the proposed residential care facility. Uh, residential care facilities are not currently permitted in the general commercial district, but they are a, a land use that's identified in our zoning code and the proposed zoning code text amendment requests to allow them with a use permit. The staff report uh, further identifies the process criteria and findings required to approve each of the requested entitlements. Uh, staff and the Planning Commission find that the requested project is consistent with those entitlements. Uh, specific zoning code sections are referenced here and were, as I, did, as I discussed, uh, included in the staff report with further discussion. Um, the CEQA process for this project uh, began uh, or resulted in an initial study mitigated negative declaration and um, there was significant amount of public engagement efforts um, undertaken by the city. The CEQA process was somewhat of the beginning of that. So in June 30th, the document was published for a 30 day public review and comment period. It was sent to all responsible agencies as required under CEQA. Um, we received two comment letters, letters in response to this, one from Caltrans and one from Fish and Wildlife. As identified in the document, all uh, potential impacts were mitigated to less than significant levels with the mitigation measures that are required through the project. And this does include um, some clarifying information that was added to the final draft that's before the council this evening, uh, just to clarify how the biologic and traffic impacts are fully addressed in the document. Um, Speaking back to the public engagement process on this, it, it's worth noting that this project will go through uh, by the end of the process four total public hearings uh, in addition to the 30 day public review and comment period that was required for the CEQA document. So this is the third public hearing of four given that it's ordinance, it's an ordinance to do the um, zoning code text amendment should the council vote to approve it tonight it will come back on consent for one more public meeting so it's just worth noting that there was a significant amount of effort undertaken uh, there were a number of comments throughout the process in addition to the two letters uh, there was letters from the general public uh, written not during the CEQA process but through the planning commission's review and comment uh, or review of the project primarily focused on biologic concerns um, as identified, uh, there was some concerns over tiger salamander uh, impacts and, and whether the project fully mitigated those. And in response, uh, additional clarifying information was provided in the document to fully identify it. And then um, as re recently as today, uh, another comment letter came in um, identifying some additional concerns over CTS and wetland impacts and the uh, project biologist has provided a response to that and that was provided on the dais uh, and available for the public to review. Um, it's worth noting that uh, all mitigation is in keeping with the fish and wildlife requirements uh, and should the project be approved, those mitigation credits uh, will have to be approved and issued by fish and wildlife prior to us issuing any building permits or, or allowing any grading of the site. Um, the Planning Commission in their discussion identified some concerns over parking uh, and some of the, the sitting plaza or frontage improvements uh, and the tree removal. In response, there were some additional conditions of approval placed on the project to clarify and uh, ensure that all documents are internally consistent with regards to the tree mitigation. Uh, the staff report includes a um, relatively robust discussion of the parking requirements and how the project does comply with those. Uh, and then finally, the trellis fronting onto Highway 116 is specifically required to satisfy some of the design requirements that the city has with regards to presence on public right-of-ways. 
So in summary, the general plan and zoning identify the location as appropriate for mixed use development. The rezoning would accommodate residential care facility for the elderly with the, within the zoning district with use permit approval. Uh, it was found to be compatible with the existing and pending developments uh, to the east of the site, um, which they, both of them combined to develop portions of the Highway 116 circulation plan, including bike, pedestrian, and transit infrastructure. And the Planning Commission and staff both support the project subject to full compliance with the conditions of approval. And given that, staff and the Commission are recommending that the Council adopt resolutions to find the project uh, consistent with the initial study mitigated negative declaration and adopt a resolution and conduct a first reading of an ordinance to allow design review, use permit, and lot line adjustments, uh, as well as the rezoning to be approved. Uh, I'll spare further reading of the full recommendation, but we are recommending the full project be approved. Um, the project applicant is here, Mr. Monahan, who uh, is available to answer any questions and, and I believe has a brief presentation. Staff is also available to answer any questions should you have any. Great. Are there any questions for staff at this point from council? No, no, no. Any questions at this point, Council Member Landman? Yeah, I, th I think I might have one, and it may be more for the developer. Um, uh, we'll see who wants to stand up and take a crack at it. But <clears throat> one concern I've heard that seems a viable concern from the public is memory care of patients to tend to water, wander. It's in their nature, and of course, the industry, as a result, has some pretty strong security to prevent this type of thing. Now, given this particular project's proximity to a relatively busy thoroughfare, uh, Gravenstein Highway, I wonder if we could just have some examples of how the applicant has met or exceeded or worked within industry standards uh, with that in particular in mind. I want to hear how that was accounted for because it's slightly different than being in other areas of town having that project there. Sure. That, I would say, is probably a better answer by the developer just given that they, they know their business. Uh, but along those lines, it is worth noting, and, and I forgot to mention in my presentation, but it was in the staff report, uh, given some of the more recent impacts with the de-energization and the fire impacts, um, there is potentially something that council would want to consider uh, with regards to requiring that the developer uh, install a generator or some enough energy storage to provide some backup power should a uh, power outage occur or some type of uh, a disaster result in um, loss of power to aid and, and uh, assist them in, in facilitating transitioning those folks. But I would again let the developer speak to that. I, I did mention that as a potential concern uh, today in a phone call and they said they don't typically require those. That's not something that's required by the state, uh, but that they could answer more. To, they could happily discuss it if the council wanted to have that conversation. All right. Very good. That's a good question too. Um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll hear from, from people on this, and I can speak from personal experience of having, you know, a parent in a memory care facility that um, it's incredibly high security. I mean, if somebody was, and I hate to use the phrase break out, but if somebody was to break out, um, I would be shocked. And again, there's probably different levels of care in different facilities owned by different organizations, but... Um, highly, highly unlikely that they could wander. But I'll leave that to the developers to discuss and if there's any public comment on those things. Um, so with no other questions for staff at this point in time, um, I'll open the public hearing and I'd like to have uh, a presentation, please. And also just um, keep it open that there may be some questions and we'll, we may want you to come back up again. I'm Steve Monahan and my IT support. <laughs> right. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you, members of the council and staff, for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, the project really was brought to the city in, in uh, January of 2014, so it's been plus or minus five years under consideration. We've had a great experience trying to develop this project and bring senior housing to Katadi, uh, also serving West, uh, West Sonoma. So it's a, it's a great project. We're very proud of it. 
and we thank you for your support. Um, uh, as you know, Planning Commission did recommend uh, approval of the project. We had a lot of iteration back and forth with staff. So we're here tonight. We can keep a very brief presentation um, to answer primarily any questions that you have, and I'll, I'll address a couple of the questions that were, that were mentioned tonight. Um, we're, we're proud of the architecture of the project. We think it looks really good. Um, we call this site REDS, uh, which is based on the old REDS recovery room, which has been there for a long time. Um, the site is, we've owned the site for about 20 years. It's fallen into disrepair, and uh, we're anxious to demolish those buildings and bring, you know, bring a nice, vibrant um, a project to that corner. We think it'll really help with the Highway 116 uh, uh, corridor and uh, a nice uh, landmark as you enter the city uh, coming from the west. So I don't want to go too far into I'll just show you a couple of the quick slides and then answer some questions. Uh, this, as uh, staff said, is the entrance to the project uh, viewed from the corner of 116 and, and Alder. Um, oops, let me get this one. I think we need the IT support back up. No, it's on the computer, but not happening on the screen. We can, we can jump straight to the question. Okay. Okay. While our IT folks are working on that, let me, um, let me address a couple of questions. Um, um, first, the, uh, the question that uh, staff brought up about the, um, the recent power outages. As we know, PG&E has kind of created a little bit of a reaction to the, uh, you know, the terrible fires that have happened, and that's a new... Uh, a new, a new uh, thing that's not really happened before. Uh, typically what we have in, in our projects is we have um, battery backup so that the, ex so that the elevators can, uh, can, can function and we have uh, battery backup on all um, uh, emergency exit lighting. So for instance, the lighting that you see up there, that's an emergency uh, light. It's got a battery backup. So if there ever were, uh, an, uh, you know, you can have a brownout but not a need to evacuate the building and so we don't provide uh, we're not required to provide by code uh, full uh, generator backup that would be you know enormously expensive and, and very complicated that's the kind of thing you see at a hospital or a emergency care type of a facility but not in a residential this is a residential type of facility so typically we would have battery backup for emergency evacuation or uh, unloading the elevators if, if that were necessary. Um, with regard to uh, wandering and safety, there, there's a, obviously there's several different levels of care in this type of facility. One level of care is assisted living, and those folks are generally, um, uh, they, they, they need assistance, but they're generally pretty, in, not independent, but they're able to function along with themselves. Uh, we have uh, staff training that helps, uh, helps those people those folks tend to, if they want to get out and, 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 and uh, go outside, um, they're, they're escorted. We have transportation provided within the facility through buses and, and, and car programs. So very rarely do you see someone in the, on the assisted living side just going outside on their own unescorted. It's possible for someone to do that, but those people are typically pretty, uh, pretty capable of, uh, my mom's 92 and she likes to go for a walk. Um, so, so that can happen. We don't see that as being a, a, a dangerous situation at all. Uh, with regard to memory care, the memory care unit is really considered a secure unit, and there are several levels of security. There's a, 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 almost like an airlock entrance where you have one set of, uh, one set of doors that are um, keypad controlled, so people really can't uh, exit that uh, facility. Uh, they have, we have a very high level of um, uh, staff oversight there, the ratio of, of patients to staff is very high, and, and there are many protocols uh, in place so that, so that those folks don't act either accidentally or intentionally um, uh, escape. If they, if they do, then there, there are alarm systems that are, that are triggered and those people are uh, 
quickly retrieved. The, I brought today, uh, just, just for the heck of it, I brought uh, a couple of um, documents. One is the United States Department of Labor. So, so these types of facilities are very highly regulated and are very highly overseen by both uh, state and federal agencies. So the state, uh, uh, state Department, uh, U.S. State Department of Labor has a, has a very uh, comprehensive set of rules we have to follow. The state is the um, Department of Health and Human Services locally, and the property is licensed, and this is just a copy of their regulations that, that oversee that. And the, the facility is licensed initially and then revisited um, annually by the, um, by the state to make sure there are no violations. And any violations count as almost like points against your license, and so you have to be very careful with that. So there's quite a lot of control and, and oversight in a facility like this. Um, so we, we feel that that is uh, adequate um, uh, protection for residents. Um, you know, these are folks that um, we are, are trusted uh, they're in, in our care to make sure that they're safe and they're well kept for and well-being, and so we take that very seriously. Um, so I, I hope that answers that question. If there's any other questions specifically, I'm happy to, to address them. Um, I think our, our slideshow is, is up and running. I'll just take a minute or two to run through that if I can. This is the um, site plan. Um, you can see the building in the, in the, to the north. Okay, these are the artist renderings. This is, again, if you were to turn in from Alder, uh, this is the view of the uh, property looking uh, toward the west. Uh, it's a two-story building. We've used kind of um, soft colors and soft materials to really blend in with the kind of um, craftsman style uh, architecture. Uh, this is uh, looking more from the east toward the west. You can see the Port Coke share. I have my laser pointer. I can point that out. Um, this is the, the drop-off area right here. Um, this over here would be the uh, memory care area, which is one story. Let's see if I can find that. Uh, again, this is just another view. Uh, this is, uh, if you're driving due west, uh, you can see here the commercial building, which is a one-story commercial building across the, across the parking lot. This is the uh, drop-off port for share for the uh, memory care. And then this is, if you're viewing, uh, looking east on 116, this is the uh, commercial building in the foreground and the memory care building in the, uh, uh, to the north. So the, the context of the project, we think, fits well within the community. We think it'll be a great asset to the community. Um, so with that, I can stand by for any questions. If I could, Mr. Monaghan, I do have, um, when we were talking about the now that PSPS is a part of everybody's vocabulary in Northern California, and we're waiting for the next power shutdown to occur. Um, so you were talking about addressing that, that question that Noah had brought up. Um, how, if, if you don't have a steady source of power, um, I'm sure in a facility like that, either memory care or assisted living, there could be people dependent on medical equipment that needs to be powered. Uh, how how is that going to be addressed? I mean, just that's kind of that worst case scenario. I understand, sure. but um, typically these these residents and patients are not of that level of high acuity. They're not on ventilators. They're not on any uh, life sustaining um, uh, equipment. Okay. So th they're not in that level of of they call it acuity in the industry. So these are folks that are able to. Uh, you know, to function uh, without uh, okay. immediate uh, medical attention. If there were some calamity like that and we had people that were, um, you know, that were in distress, those people would probably be transferred to, to a hospital. But with the, these power, rolling power outages that we've had, it's a new, it's a new experience. Um, uh, you know, getting a, gen getting a generator on the project to run the entire project is, is you know, not, not very not feasible. Yeah. It's not very feasible. No, I, I get that. And I, I'm just thinking, again, long term, but, you know, um, we were updating our emergency operation plan at our last meeting, and I think this needs to play into the mix of these kinds of facilities that have um, people who may have more urgent needs 
when power is out um, that I think, you know, once it's built, you have time to do all this, but to have a conversation with city staff about that and, you know, make sure that city staff, whether it's, you know, the police department and, or wherever, has the right and the exact contact number, not like a general phone number. I mean, they're going to probably drive over there because it's a small city. But, you know, I'm just, I want to throw that out there because I just don't want it left behind as, oh, yeah, we didn't really talk about that. And, and I want to make sure it's in the discussion now. That's all I'm, I'm throwing out there now. So I'm not looking for an answer, but I'm just saying I think there needs to be that discussion, whoever the providers are going to be, um, that they indeed have conversations with city staff about that. Just throwing that out Understood. there. Understood. Yeah, great. Okay, any uh, other questions for Mr. Monaghan? Go ahead, Councilmember Landman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So thank you for that. So basically, if I was to summarize, you have at least two levels of control plus an alarm system and then a very heavy ratio of staff to patients at the memory care unit. And in this industry, that would be considered sufficient even in an area that has busier traffic and such. That's correct. Okay. Let me ask you, since we're kind of dealing now with a new problem, that nobody has a handle on yet when we look at the new reality of, what is it now, 10 years potentially of roving power outages, how would a power loss, a long-term one, not just a few hours one day, security at the memory uh, unit? Are the key entries mechanical or are they electronic? Um, how long does the, we have an idea of how long the battery backup would last? Uh, typically the battery backup is about a 24 hour life uh, uh, support. I think if the power outages ex you know, exceeded that, I think we would probably staff up to be able to, to man that. Um, you know, these are unusual circumstances. I don't think we've ever had that kind of thing happen. Uh, right. Routinely, so I think it's a little bit uh, uh, breaking new ground. We're all trying to figure it yeah, out. We're, ho we're, ho we're hoping we don't have that problem. Um, you know, the project will have the ability to bring generators in. I mean, that's also something that can be done. Um, you know, they, the, the systems are, are designed in such a way that if you had to, you could plug in uh, uh, temporary emergency generators. But mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a band-aid over the problem. Um, I mean, I think we all rely on PG&E for our, for our power, and, and, and if that system starts to break down... You're starting a much longer... Yeah, we got a bigger, <laughs> we got a bigger problem. ...discussion than tonight's discussion, exactly. but uh, understood. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so bottom line, you could respond with temporary emergency backup material, um, generators. You could staff up. There's several ways to deal with that. Yes. All right, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, at this point in time you can uh, have a seat. We may call you back up if okay. there's further questions from the public. Um, I do have one additional question for staff. I know we have the public comment open. I'm going to get to folks. Um, can you address um, maybe what, I'm trying to phrase this right, what mitigation measures are out there for the biological resources, specifically the California tiger salamander, but I, there are other resources, but kind of how is that being addressed? Sure. So I'm going to uh, ask Olivia Irvin to speak to that. I, I have a pretty solid knowledge of those requirements, but she is an environmental planner and she wrote the document. So I'm going to trade seats with her unless she can get them. Oh, she'll go to the podium. She uh, can give you the exact details. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Olivia Irvin. Uh, so there are a number of mitigation measures that were identified in the MND, and those are carried over into the Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program, which has been uh, revised to address comments from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, there are, gosh, I think about six, uh, nope, eight biological mitigation measures. Uh, you, do you want me to walk through all of those, or you're specifically interested in the salad? Well, I'm, I'm I'm interested in all of them. I think I'm looking for just that 30,000 foot elevation, you know, what are those mitigation measures in general? And if you want to specifically talk briefly about the CTS, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of history here. This project site has been uh, surveyed and monitored for, uh, gosh, I think about a decade. There's been multiple uh, biological surveys and reports that were done, uh, and all of that documentation is summarized in the MND and the supporting uh, biological studies. The, um, 
the mitigation is basically for CTS is triggered because of the uh, nexus with fill to wetlands, and so it triggers a uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, consultation, and that requires that both the the service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife both uh, concur with the um, mitigation credits and uh, that those be purchased and for replacement of the habitat lost. So um, the, the mitigation measure is set forth there to um, offset the loss of potential breeding habitat, even though there's no record of CTS occurring on the site uh, in recent history. There's a, a record in the past of them relocating species um, from the site. So it was presumed for purposes of the analysis that they could potentially be present. So the mitigation is um, to, uh, to offset 5.63 acres of the project site and purchase replacement credits at an acceptable bank that would be approved by the department, uh, as I mentioned, both the Department of Fish and Wildlife and, uh, and the, the, Cal the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the purpose of those mitigation credits, as I understand them, you know, in lieu of having habitat, if you will, a little spot here, a spot there, and a spot there, you know, 15 little spots over 50 acres, let's just say, um, you're purchasing an area of land that is going to be set aside for that specific species, whether it's a tiger salamander or some plant species. and. The reality is the, the refugia that you're providing, the large piece of land, is probably far more beneficial, if that's the right word, to the species than if you have, let's, you know, we think there's habitat there, let's just put a fence around it. Isn't that the purpose of that? That's correct. So what you're referring to is there is a much larger regional strategy to protect this um, wildlife and specifically CTS as well as uh, three plant species, and that is part of the Santa Rosa Plain Conservation Strategy, and now the uh, recovery plan as well. So uh, that is precisely accurate that there has been these core areas and management areas identified uh, to ensure that habitat is not fragmented, that those uh, species are protected, and uh, that mitigation banks are established in those areas where they are or already occur. Uh, so those, those mitigation banks have been, um, there are a handful of those for the plants within that same core area, and there is um, within 2.5 miles of the project site an appropriate mitigation bank for the California tiger salamander as well. Uh, you would have seen that in the, the response to the comment that was raised recently in those, um, those graphics that were provided on the dais as well this evening. Great. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And we may need to call you back up as well. So uh, so the public hearing is still open. Uh, is there anyone? I have no cards, but Ms. Alderman? As usual, I have to give you guys some realities. I was an occupational therapist in a, for a year in a similar one on a locked ward um, dementia unit. The, it's, the staff is not going to say how many elopements there are. There are usually month, monthly. It was only when, it was only reported when the police had to come out and search. Doors are left open. The staff is untrained and very low paid. It's not, it's not, you can say this, but it's not going it, to, that's not going to be the reality. I've never heard of a two-story locked unit. Um, have you ever dealt with people, dementia patients in the dark? It's not pretty. They have sound downing issues and all that. Um, then there's the big thing. You're all not talking about the West Katati turn that for 25 years my neighborhood has been asking um, for you guys to correct and you haven't saved up a, a whole a cent for it. And you're going to allow this 17,000 worth of cars and vehicles next to this highway, next after this dangerous 270-degree left-hand turn off 116 
to um, West Katahdi Avenue, and everybody knows illegally for decades, people go to the right because they're into the dirt. They come out right in front of the assisted living, the proposed assisted living, and you're not go dealing with it. You're putting in a, a turn lane. Um, I, all your charts don't show the turn. And that's, our whole neighborhood has been asking for decades. You're supposed to put in $10 million worth of improvements. And I would be for the project if the $10 million worth of improvements were there. But they're not. You're putting people's lives at risk, especially the elderly. Um, I've worked with them. These guys, they're, they're not safety aware. They may not even know they're on the highway. This is a really bad idea until you fix the road. I, it's good. I feel sorry for Mr. Monahan. He's been through all this, but it's not the best project there at this time. That it needs, you need to deal with the traffic issues, fix Katati, West Katati Avenue turn before anything is approved. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Mr. Barrett? Why like is my phone doing that? <laughs> Hold on, don't start his time yet. It's Siri. That's right, I thought you said Siri. I found this on the web, but why is it's my okay, phone? It's okay, sir, go ahead. <laughs> this is not okay. I'm not talking to this thing. It's, it's really scary. I'm going to turn this completely off. Wow. Sorry about that. Now we can start over. I'd first like to address uh, procedure here before I get on to some other issues. <clears throat> Um, I've mentioned this to the council before. When council has questions for city staff or for the developer, I would, your Katati city council member handbook speaks to this issue, as does the, your edition of the League of California Cities manual for council members. If you have questions, you want to get them to staff before the meeting and get them to the developer so they're not blindsided by your question so they can properly prepare to answer you fully. I don't like this game playing that, you're, uh, that you're, you're doing here, trying to show how smart you are, and putting Mr. Monaghan and his staff on, uh, on the spot here. I've mentioned it before. Secondly, we all have email, okay, so do this. Okay, so secondly, how many council members here think that Highway 116 at the proposed location is going to stay one lane, one lane in each direction traffic, a two-lane highway? How many think it's going to stay that way in the foreseeable future? Seeing no hands, I would have to agree with you. The plan for Highway 116 is at least a four-lane highway improvement over the next 20 to 30 years, plus Katati's probably going to insist that there be 12-foot sidewalks on each side. That's going to be a commercial corridor going all the way out to Stony Point, or at least to the end, end of city limits. So I don't see from the plans here how you are going to account for, uh, or how you've accounted for proper setback for when the highway gets widened, probably in our lifetime. Um, I see that you have a retail uh, a, a store there. Caltrans will buy that and blow that building up and tear it down, which is going to eliminate a lot of the parking. The parking is not designed right if Highway uh, 116 is going to be widened to four lanes. I would like, like you and the developer to speak to this issue. All right. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this issue? Ms. Blaker? Thank you. <clears throat> a couple of things. One is on um, the residents walking, and I think, uh, as Mr. Monaghan said, some, uh, his mother at 92 walks. We had a neighbor who is now 106 who was walking around Katadi at least a few miles every day till a few years ago. Where could the residents safely walk, um, preferably not on Highway 116? I'm wondering if there's any possible way of putting a walkway 
through the property, through the Lowe's property or the houses that are going to be built there so that there's some connectivity to um, East Katadi uh, or also crossing Highway 116. Um, how would that be made safe? Um, and then on the California tiger salamander habitat, um, the environmental consultant just now referred to an acceptable bank, mitigation bank, and the paperwork does say that the applicant shall secure credits from the West Katati Core California tiger salamander area, which is a very specific area described by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and I'm wondering how that will be addressed. In other words, will the mitigation happen on site in the West Katati Core area as it seems to be required? Or is it going to be a few miles away in an existing mitigation bank? Thank you. And thank you. Um, let me just finish writing this down. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this topic? All right, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Um, I will invite uh, the applicants to come back up and address any of these questions if you'd like. Um, let me first, oh, no, please come on up. I was going to start with staff, see if they had any comments as well. But um, let's, let's start with staff and see if there any of those questions that came up, if you have any uh, replies for those as well. So it's uh, worth noting that the project design does anticipate full widening of Highway 116 and actually helps facilitate that widening by dedicating a significant amount of the project frontage to the city in order to allow that widening to occur. So if you look on uh, site map C2, That's packet page 113. Thank you. So it identifies all of the, the dedications of right-of-way that are required as a part of this project. And it includes both dedications of right-of-way and what we call irrevocable offers of dedication, whereby the developer gives the city an offer for further right-of-way to be dedicated when the city is ready to, to develop those roadways. But uh, number one identified on site map C2 is the right-of-way dedication for the future widening of Highway 116. It's further uh, worth identifying that this project actually implements uh, widening of the project, installing turn lanes to access this site and an interim traffic signal until the full build-out of, um, of the circulation improvements identified in the general plan do, does occur. So staff has um, worked with traffic, the Public Works Department and traffic engineers on the access to the sites and the interim improvements, um, which do include partial widening of 116 to uh, accommodate some of the concerns that were raised. Uh, those frontage improvements do also include sidewalks. Um, while we're looking at this site, it's, it's worth noting that uh, the Planning Commission recently approved development of the site directly adjacent across Alder, um, just east of this site, also fronting on 116, which also incro incorporates frontage improvements some dedication of right of way for future widening uh, and also sidewalk improvements which are required to be constructed as a part of the project which connect about two-thirds of the existing unimproved um, area right now with sidewalk providing access further to the east um, it does also include a transit stop for uh, bus stops so people can use uh, public transit and we have while it's not a requirement of the project we have uh, engaged with the final property owner uh, further to the east before you get to Redwood Highway um, about a potential interim trail. We have no commitments on that now, but we are aware of the concern and we are working to try to provide full pedestrian connectivity um, from these sites all the way into the eastern part of the city. All right, very good. Thank you for that. Um, again, you're welcome to come up and address anything. If there was questions that you may have heard, would love to hear your replies. I think one question I may throw out there too, just as a reminder to you, I wrote it down. Somebody did say that um, the two-story facility, but that's not for the memory care. That's a one-story facility, correct? That's correct. The two-story is assisted living. That's okay, right. great. Thank you. Great. Go ahead. And, and I think as, as staff just mentioned with regard to the widening of 116, so uh, 116 has been anticipated to be widened to two lanes in each direction. Our side of the property is designed to accommodate that and then the commercial building that Mr. Barrage mentioned is also has a further setback from that future 
dedication so that the sidewalk that's being put in anticipates as if the road was uh, 116 was widened. So we hope that, uh, that that's far enough <laughs> to the north that that's not gonna be a problem. Um, and I, I think as staff pointed out, there are a number of improvements that are going on at that intersection of Alder and 116, which will uh, a left turn lane uh, as you're traveling eastbound on 116 is required. Also improvements to uh, Alder. The approach to Alder and 116 is a little steep, so that's gonna be flattened out. Uh, the bus stop, so there are quite a number of, of improvements. There's an interim traffic signal required. So that, that although it doesn't address one of the concerns further, uh, further east on uh, West Katati Avenue, it does address the immediate adjacencies to the project. Um, with regard to the Ca uh, California tiger salamander and the three um, uh, rare plant species, those plant species are uh, Sonoma Sunshine, um, uh, Burke's Goldfield, and Sebasto Meadowfoam, as well as uh, California tiger salamander. All of those are um, theoretically impacted by the development of the project, and the project is required to purchase mitigation credits um, elsewhere in order to offset those potential loss of habitat. So uh, as project sponsors, we purchase property, purchase credits in a mitigation bank um, in the immediate, and, and the, there's, a, there's a document that was uh, circulated in the immediate West Katati uh, area, there are no existing mitigation banks right now that have been developed. They may be developed in the future, but our biologists did check with U.S. Fish and Wildlife to see that it would be acceptable to be in what's called the, um, uh, the Hazel Mitigation Bank, which is two and a half miles to the north, uh, northwest. Um, and so that is acceptable to the uh, agencies that are responsible for habitat control. And so we confirmed that, and, and so we feel like that is in compliance. Um, so that habitat will be preserved in a more uh, non-fragmented area where, where those species can flourish. And um, we are making provisions to do that before we break ground and commence grading. And if I could ask, on that map where it's showing the hazel mitigation bank, it's um, kind of a bluish color on the map, is that is what's depicted there the amount of acreage that you need to purchase, or is that it's just within that funny shape, whatever it's called? Yes, that, that's an existing bank that's already been certified by the various agencies, and we are purchasing uh, a portion of, of credits within that bank. I'm not sure how big it is, um, but we will be por uh, purchasing a portion of those credits, um, which enable those mitigation banks to to become established and to protect the species. Okay, great. Thank you for replying to those questions that's, that uh, the audience had. Um, okay. I'll we, back. Again, we may call you back up, but uh, do we have any questions from council for either staff? I'll start with Council Member Moore. Well, Mr. Lawman, I am going to call you back up. Thank you. No, sorry about that. I just wanted you to sound first and I get up. So there was, there was talk about the safety backup and, and generator backup, and code doesn't require it. Um, <clears throat> are you, I didn't see in here, and I may have missed it with the uh, enormity of the packet, um, the, <clears throat> the solar on that facility. Can you delve into that a little bit? Um, I'd have to go back and check. I think that we are required to provide 10% solar um, photovoltaic solar panels on the building to provide 10% of the, of the uh, usage uh, of the facility. Okay, so, the, so you're just gonna go with the minimum on the 10% solar? Well, that's a minimum amount. I think that you have to really analyze the solar exposure. Um, right now we're doing another project and we're looking at um, battery backup banks that Tesla company makes now where uh, you're not only are you on the grid, but you also can store energy in these. Um, uh, they're improving uh, storage capacity of of batteries, essentially. And so it, it's our hope that as that technology improves, we can utilize perhaps even more solar energy and put that into a, a reserve power on site. But there's no requirement at this point in time. 
Uh, I think the condition of approval is that we must provide a minimum of 10% of the uh, property's uh, energy consumption through, um, uh, through solar. Okay. There's, there's a lot of newer facilities that I see that have the um, carports, with the solar panels on the carports and electric charging stations. Um, I didn't see any of that here. I know that you're not going to have um, a significant amount of traffic coming from seniors in, a, in an assisted living and or a memory care, but you will have staff there and things like that. So um, that, that's something that I would like to see addressed a little bit more. Um, do you, are you planning on running this or are you going to sub this out to a providers or who's going to run this operation? Uh, we have a, an affiliated company called Sterling Senior Communities, which is, which is, uh, manages and operates um, assisted living facilities. And so we're considering this could be an in-house um, uh, management. Okay. And with that, you don't necessarily know what staffing levels are going to be, do you? We haven't gotten there yet, no. On the commercial building, looking at the schematics, it appears that you would drive in and then the entrance to that commercial building would be behind the 116 frontage. Is that correct? Yes, you would enter from the north side, correct. Okay. Um, so as you look, if you go back to the slides and you look at the um, view of the entrance off of Alder from 116 heading west, it's, it's a very eye-pleasing view. Coming, going east on 116 with that commercial building right in the corner, do you have any pictures of that? We've taken our, uh, our graphic computer down. So that's it. Was this the side you were referring to? Yeah. Right. So this is the this is the side of the building facing 116, and based on city's uh, design criteria, they uh, require the um, access really to be on the other side of the building. They didn't want parking, um, you know, in a more conventional way where you would have parking in front of the building and then the building set back. So here you bring the buildings to the 116. Uh, what they call a build-to line, and then the access to the building and the parking is around the back to, to hide the parking, if you will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Um, that's all I have at the moment. Thank you. I'm happy to okay. remain here for any. <laughs> well, you never know. We'll, we'll go down to our next council member, Council Member Landman, and see if he has any questions specific to you. I don't for you, Mr. Monahan. Thank you. I actually do for staff, though. At least I think you're good. If you want to stay there to be safe, you're welcome to. Uh, I want to go back to traffic, and specifically it was mentioned uh, concern about having the new planned left-hand turn lane versus some potential requirement or need for having a stop sign at this point in time. So I want to clarify and make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Since I'm about to vote on it, that would probably be a good thing to do. Uh, I understand that, number one, there are funds identified, set aside, eventually when the time comes to put a stop sign there, but also that Caltrans doesn't require a stop sign yet in that area because traffic is not at a level that requires it, and that's one main reason it's not being built as part of this project. I want to confirm that's correct. Uh, then I want to ask, is there anything in the work that's been done, in the traffic studies that have been done this, that indicates that this left-hand turn lay is in any way more dangerous than any typical left-hand turn lane on a, on a small highway naturally is. And then actually, if there's any legal or safety issues specific to this area that would require us to build a stop sign now as opposed to when the traffic by Caltrans control would require it. I think this would be good to clear up. I'd like to understand that. Thank you. Sure. So uh, you are correct in that uh, the installation of a signal at Alder in 116 is driven by what we call traffic warrants. So when the signal is warranted based on the volume of tra 
traffic that's flows. That's when the signal installation is triggered. The applicant uh, does re is required to contribute a significant num uh, number of costs towards that project uh, improvement. However, because the warrants or the full traffic impacts wouldn't just be driven by their individual project, the city does not have the legal ability or nexus to require that they fund that signal completely. Um, getting back to your other issues, absolutely the right-hand turn lane from 116 onto Alder as your westbound is a safety improvement required by uh, the traffic engineer design, as is the left-hand turn lane into Alder if you're eastbound. Both of those are intended to improve access to the site and safety of 116. So just in conclusion, would it be fair to say that if this project goes through as planned, conditions in this road will be safer than they are today, generally? There will be significant safety improvements installed as a part of this project. Thank you. I'm sorry, we, we did close the public comment. Thanks. I gave everybody a chance, and now it's our turn. And just, just to confirm. If, but to say something, you're kind of interrupting the meeting, so please don't. I'm just asking if you don't. Thanks. Just to confirm, Council Members Moore's uh, the, the discussion earlier, the project is required to install one EV charging station to serve the commercial structure as a condition number 60, 76 and 10% of the project is required to be served through photovoltaic panels, and that's condition number 79. One, one charging station? To serve the uh, commercial. The commercial building itself, I can look on the plans to identify if there are any specifically for the uh, assisted living or memory care. That was a condition added to I believe expand the number of EV charging stations, but I want to look on the plans to confirm. All right, and Councilmember Lehman, you're done with questions? I am, thank you very much. Okay. Vice Mayor Skillman. Uh, I think by going last, I get most of my questions already answered. Um, and then, and, and just to make sure that I'm reading this correctly, there are no entrances uh, into the facility off of 116. Is that accurate? That's accurate, that's correct. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure I was reading all the plans correctly. Um, and I think you had already mentioned the, the one and two stories. So those were the two things that I were, was thinking about. And then um, on that, on the one packet page there, there's a, seem to be um, courtyards or something designated with walking areas that go in circles. Is that? Let me see. It is packet page. It's uh, title sheet uh, title sheet C1 dash dot zero. Yeah, that's correct. That's internal to the building. Okay. So are those are those walking areas then inside the building, or is that on the first floor? I believe it's a outdoor courtyard, yes. completely surrounded by the building. So it's an area for people to go outside, but stay within the uh, the confines of the structure. Okay. Gotcha, and, and thank you for clarifying too about the improvement on the sidewalks, and, and I do like that idea of having it connected to what's across from Alder once that's developed as well. So, no, thank you very much for putting together this very comprehensive report. I appreciate it. Yeah, and just as a follow-up to that, Vice Mayor, the, um, you know, the, the, the outdoor courtyards that exist, depending on whether it's assisted living or or memory care, the memory care ones typically are fenced in. And, and I'm speaking from very recent observation of probably 12 different memory care facilities in Sonoma County uh, that my family, we all personally went and checked them out. Um, some were better than others. You know, some people don't manage them well enough, uh, don't have enough staff, and, and others were not only highly rated, but um, you could see that and as things have been turning out, it's, it's you know, an excellent area. But memory care is very different than assisted living. I mean, memory care, you are very limited, and there's a fair amount of structure on what is done every day. Um, they're incredibly, they're busier than I am, what they do. There's just activities all the time. But I think with assisted living, there's typically, there's more freedom. Um, that's not to say that they go out and just start to wander. Um, it's still very heavily supervised from what I've seen personally. Uh, so with that, I don't have any additional questions for the applicants. Thank you for being here and addressing uh, the questions asked. And I think I 
have had all of my questions that I wrote down answered by staff. So with that, I think we are, uh, the recommendation from staff now is um, kind of long, it's several steps, so who's willing to take that on? Unless staff has any last minute questions or comments? Just to uh, clarify that sheet, 99 sheet a3 sorry packet page 99 does identify five EV uh, parking spaces serving the assisted living memory care and then staff added one additional condition for the commercial building okay, okay. Um, how do we get this up to more solar percentage So there's no building code requirement for uh, commercial solar installation under the pending building permit, uh, or I'm sorry, building code adoption that is later on the agenda. Uh, I believe you could talk to the applicant if there are concerns over the ability to um, serve the site with photovoltaics or an interest in having more electricity generation serving the site with photovoltaics. I don't know that that answered my question. I think you're right. <laughs> How do we get more solar on there? So the council um, could uh, entertain a, a con an idea about conditioning the project to increase the solar. Um, there is a use permit. This is a rezoning. There's a number of, of requested uh, entitlements that are uh, being requested by the applicant. I'd like to confer maybe with the city attorney over the uh, ability to add that condition. Uh, given the nexus question. I, I don't know if it's a, a concern or if it's something that the, the council would like to see um, as we move forward, especially with more of these uh, PSPSs down the road that we may encounter um, and uh, environmentally more conscious um, if we can use those resources so to make you, this more of a green, greener building. So you're asking a couple of different things. So is it more vehicle charging stations or are you talking about photovoltaics up on a well, roof, for example? Mr. Um, Howish addressed the, photovoltaic, or the um, charging stations and there was more charging stations there. Right. So it's the photovoltaic for the system. Right. So is, the there, is there an opportunity to expand? And the fact that the applicant has now walked back to the podium he may have a reply for you. Well, just, just to kind of add a little bit more color to that. So um, uh, these facilities do use energy and, you know, accomplishing 10% of their usage from solar is, is hard to do. You're limited to the amount of kind of south facing um, roof area that you have and also the efficiencies of the existing photovoltaic system. So. 10% is achievable. When you start to get above that, you have to look at, uh, you know, either creating more surface area, either covering carports, uh, doing other things like that in order to do that. And that starts to become, uh, uh, you know, both a cost factor and an aesthetic factor. So it, it's difficult to get more than 10% um, uh, just given the, the architecture and the design and the amount of south facing uh, roof uh, area. Well, and if I may jump in too, it sounded like you were already exploring the idea of the um, photovoltaic uh, batteries that you were discussing about that Tesla's developing, um, that if that was something that could be used, like you were saying on a current project, that it might be something you could implement here if it turns out to be something that's beneficial as far as storing the energy for a longer period of time to be used like for a battery backup or something. So it sounds like you're already exploring those options to try to improve. Yes, we are. We're trying to be as environmentally correct. There are other green aspects to the project that we haven't gone into today. That's just one, um, you know, one aspect of trying to maximize that. We, we would love to, uh, it's, it, it, it's helpful for us for, from a cost standpoint, the more we can be off the grid, we'd like to be off the grid, but there is a balance point between um, how much how much you can physically accomplish. Um, and the fact that, you know, PV systems can be added in the future, obviously, because PV systems didn't exist X number of years ago, and people are adding them, you know, here and there. Um, you know, I, I totally appreciate what you're saying. And yeah, I would, I would agree that, you know, every project that we have, you know, we should try to push as hard as we can. Uh, but I also feel that 
there's been an inordinate amount of staff and public time put into this project. It's a good project. We can move it forward and we can look once it's, once the facility is up and running and they have an idea of, you know, here's what these costs are and then you may or may not entertain. I, I'm not sure we'd want to, I'm not sure I'd be interested in putting uh, something in writing that says you will do this at this point in time. That's just my two cents worth. So, staff, did you? So after consulting with the city attorney, we do not believe there's nexus, given that the city does not have an adopted requirement to, to um, yeah. mandate a certain uh, amount of solar. We've never adopted a mandate for that. There's no ordinance that, that mandates that for commercial development. Uh, one option may be to, um, given that there's questions about the available surface area on the structure, one option may be to modify condition 79, which currently says 10% of the project's electricity use is required to be offset through installation of photovoltaic panels to say um, something regarding the uh, available surface area must be, all available surface area must be utilized for solar. Uh, but again, I think we're kind of questioning the nexus given that we don't have a policy that mandates that for commercial development. What was the solar requirement on the station's project found on Centero? 20, 15 or 20 percent? Because it's residential versus commercial? 20. The 20. representative from the uh, developer here, Colvin Group, says 20 percent. So we can do 20 on residential on a big building, large. They large. may have voluntarily agreed to that. Mm. That's kind of the difference. So that's what I'm looking for, a voluntary agreement. I just don't, I mean, we, you know, we're happy to, to do as much as we can. I think that there are limits to the architecture and how much you can, you can physically put on the building. Um, the other thing is that these panels, you know, the panels of today are much more efficient than they were 10 years ago. So I would imagine 10 years from now, there's going to be more, a next generation of, of panels. And so I, I think it's also, there's a cost benefit to utilizing uh, photovoltaics, which uh, we would probably be taking advantage of, regardless of, of what the requirement would be. Which I think is great that they're much more efficient so that you may not necessarily have to have as many solar panels. Right. So sure, but it's a big, it's a big building. It's a 100,000 square foot building. And so you've got a, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of energy. And, and so there. you probably have 20%, 25% southern exposure? I, I don't know. I, I'd have to look at it. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, um, Mr. Mayor, Lyman, okay. if I might. Oh, yes, please. On this subject, great subject to talk about. I mean, one thing we're missing right now, I, I share your concern. I like the direction. The one problem is that there's one point in time at least, and I want to stress this is more temporary than a permanent situation, but especially in Northern California and, and the whole state, we have more solar than we can use uh, during the sunny parts of the day. And so for the moment, it's kind of a problem. If the uh, developer was actually ready to move forward on storage in this particular project, I got the sense more you're investigating it, you're not ready to commit to it tonight, that would be really beneficial. Storage is very helpful, even if you have a smaller amount of PV, being able to save that and use that at the lower end of what they call the duck curve, the evening hours when that generation from solar and wind drops. That would be a very beneficial thing. Uh, I've said it before, I get in trouble for it, but uh, using Evergreen works very well that way too. But I think the whole discussion is good and it leads to probably we at some point should come back with an agenda item to take a look at what is a modern, appropriate, and reasonable request in terms of development for standards that actually helps with this issue rather than calling for PV arrays that perhaps are not truly helpful for the issues we're concerned about and meets, you know, the current time. I'd be happy to see that. I would be a little uncomfortable putting a condition on tonight for arrays or storage or even uh, evergreen because we don't have costs calculated. That might be something that might be good to do with projects in the future to do is know what the costs of adding solar might be when we have a decision on a better framework of how we want to do solar in this town, what the costs of evergreen might be to see what's the most cost effective for the developer and brings the biggest bang, environmental bang for the buck. So maybe we could come back with something like that. 
My experience with projects like this is once they are approved and built, then that's the way they stand. Now, if we could put some sort of condition to potentially investigate or explore further voltaic um, cells or uh, solar generation within like a five-year period or something like that, you know, um, that would be something that I could live with. We could absolutely add a condition that directs the developer to explore opportunities for further solar uh, generation to enhance or expand on the 10 percent mandate. That would be great. Okay. And Mr. Then, Mayor, if I could just offer one additional thought on this. Um, I've seen some other jurisdictions uh, require conduit to be added because if it's added at the time of construction, it's a lot cheaper than trying to add it uh, in the future when you install solar. So that might be something for the applicant to consider. Which I believe we did that with uh, Kessing Ranch, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and, and I would say if, if you are going to put a condition like that in there, um, maybe we broaden it and say not only, you know, photovoltaic, but also possibility of storage since they're interested in even looking at it. So just to keep it open. Okay. Thank you. Are we, uh, are we good with that? And are we ready for a motion? I mean, let me just say I am ready for a motion. <laughs> I got that sense. Let's see if you take a swing at this here without reading the whole thing. I'd like to move the council adopt resolutions and introduce an ordinance to one as described on packet page 81, uh, recommendation paragraph one, find that the initial study and resulting mitigated negative declaration analyzing the potential environmental impacts of the Townsend Sterling assisted living, memory care and retail project adequately analyze and mitigate the potential environmental impacts of the proposed project in keeping with the requirements of CEQA and two, approve preliminary design review, a use permit and lot line adjustment as described in the rest of paragraph two. And three, move that first reading of this ordinance. As amended. As, yes, as amended, uh, five year look back at PV storage. Very good. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. I dare ask, is there any further discussion on this topic? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Please show 401 vote on that. Thank you all very much, and thank you for the input from everybody out there as well. Now we'll go to item 10B, which is Katadi Station Apartment Project, second one-year time extension, and grant of inclusionary housing funds. And we're going back to Mr. Hausch. I think your mic is off. Mike. Thank you, sir. And uh, I did not have a PowerPoint for this presentation, uh, but the item before the council this evening, uh, item 10B, is a Katadi Station Apartment Project second one-year time extension request and also a request from Bridge Housing for a grant of inclusionary housing funds. Um, so on October 25th, 2016, the City Council will recall approving uh, design review uh, for the Katadi Station Apartment Projects, which is a mixed-use development consisting of 74 multifamily units and 5,500 square feet of commercial space on 2.42 acres. Uh, it also includes a half-acre public park and a 0.65-acre community parking area, all on Santero Way, directly adjacent to the Smart Station. Um, that project has not pulled building permits, and uh, therefore, and the design has not changed. I'm sorry. Um, a public improvement agreement was accepted and approved by the council uh, in April of 2018. Building permits have been submitted and are nearly ready to issue, but they have not been issued. Um, the applicant, uh, identifying some concerns over cost, uh, has not moved forward with pulling those building permits, but has submitted a second one-year extension, request for a one-year extension to grant another year, um, essentially keeping these approvals alive. Uh, to October 23rd, 2020, if the council chooses to approve that. Um, no projects have, no elements of the project have changed. All details identified in the, in the packet uh, are consistent with the past approvals. 
Um, there's a second request from Bridge Housing uh, from the city to grant inclusionary housing funds. Uh, but before I get into that, I wanted to identify that the newspaper notice for the extension was slightly less than 10 days, and therefore we will be re-noticing this and bringing it back two weeks from today. However, because we had everyone invited and we had noticed the meeting, we wanted to go, hold, go ahead and hold the public uh, hearing for the item. Uh, secondarily, the request from Bridge uh, is not subject to that 10-day requirement, and so that is absolutely before the council and the uh, resolution can be adopted for that this evening. So the request from Bridge Housing, who is a Bay Area housing developer, um, came uh, given that they have an interest in purchasing the project from the Colvin Group. Um, they intend to develop the project as a 100% mixed income affordable workforce housing project. Uh, there's some background on bridge housing in the staff report, but they're a San Francisco-based affordable housing developer. Um, however, for them to uh, finance the project, they need a contribution from the city kind of as the initial nest egg for them to leverage additional funds from the county and then the state uh, and other uh, tax credit financing mechanisms. And so they have requested that the city uh, provide $750,000 from the city's inclusionary housing fund to help cover the cost of that construction. Uh, it's intended to be developed on a mix of income levels. Uh, and the project does include the 134 spaces required for uh, the project itself, parking spaces, and then additional parking spaces uh, on the street, which would be public, and essentially a smart overflow parking lot, uh, bringing the total that the project would construct to 186 parking spaces, in addition to a half acre city park adjacent to the site. Um, it's worth noting that the, should the council choose to approve this request for $750,000, um, the project has been conditioned to uh, provide a mix of affordability that fills the city's RENA requirements through 2022, so no additional affordable housing requirements would be uh, left from the city's RENA allocation. Uh, and the total dollar amount is just worth noting. Uh, at that request is $10,135 per unit. Uh, that would be a subsidy from the city. Uh, in my career, I've never seen a number that low. It's worth noting. It's usually significantly higher. Um, and Bridge intends to move forward with construction should this happen uh, and likely would start next season. It's not discussed in the staff report, but it's worth noting that uh, the city, uh, working with the Colvin Group and Bridge, held a neighborhood meeting uh, here in the Katati room to allow, or I'm sorry, at the police department to allow uh, neighborhood residents to hear the proposal, talk to Bridge, hear from Bridge and, and the Colvin group as to what's being requested. Uh, staff attended that meeting to listen to the concerns. The number one concern from the neighborhood was parking. They are very concerned about parking. Uh, they expressed a lot of concerns over student tenants doubling up in units and, and having multiple vehicles, more than the number of bedrooms. Um, Bridge had some uh, responses to that that I believe uh, Brad from Bridge intends to discuss. Um, and then just finally, the, there's a section in the staff report talking about financial considerations. Uh, as again mentioned, they're requesting $750,000 from the housing fund. It's required to be spent on affordable housing. Uh, staff, in looking at that number, was concerned over uh, kind of maintaining a nest egg for future RENA allocations uh, starting in the 2023 cycle. Uh, the current balance of the trust fund is about $2.1 million. Uh, there's also a million dollar loan to the sewer fund that may be available in that next cycle. Um, but should the council approve this, it would leave a remaining balance as of today of uh, about $1.4 million available uh, for future affordable housing projects. And there is only one other affordable housing project under consideration right now, uh, and that's a five unit project on Jamie Lane, Ryan Lane, uh, and they are not requesting any significant funds from that. Uh, so just to be aware of that. Uh, should you decide to move forward with the extension request, um, the uh, project has been identified as exempt, exempt from CEQA as the original approval also was exempt. So given that, I am available for any questions, but I, and there's representatives from both Bridge Housing and the Colvin Group here uh, to round out any questions or provide additional input. And I believe Brad would like to give a presentation. Great, and just one thing I'd like to add, if I could, while you're walking up to uh, Mr. Housh, is that August 16th, we did have a uh, public gathering um, where we went with Bridge and looked at a couple of sites that they, uh, up in Santa Rosa, that they currently manage. One that was a site for 10 years, one that was a site for 20 years, 
and four of the five council members were there. I know Mr. Moore was not in town then, um, but the four, of, the rest of the four of us did go, just as far as public disclosure goes. And and I also went to the Sacramento site and looked at one of the sites in Sacramento. Right. Okay. Back to you. Hi, Guy Chambers of the Colvin Group. Um, let's see. I wanted to uh, just very, very briefly go over the the parking numbers. I think we've been up here many, many times and talked about how parking is such a concern to the neighborhood. So let me see if I can run through the numbers. I have a slight variance from what Noah had in terms of his parking count, so I'll give you what I counted, and hopefully there's not that much differential in there. Um, the project's required to have 134 parking spaces. That's a result of 116 for the residential portion, 18 for the commercial portion. So we get to a total of 134 parking spaces. Um, some of those spaces will take place in terms of 106 on-site parking spaces. You'll note that there's a delta there, there's a slight underpark on-site, but we're taking care of that by parking on the street, which is allowable by the Katati codes. Um, we're taking out a number of existing parallel parking spaces along Santero Way as being replaced by a much more efficient perpendicular parking system. So we actually, in the same linear footage, we gain many more parking spaces as a result of transitioning from the parallel parking to a perpendicular parking configuration. In doing that, we're also widening Santero Way. It's currently 20 feet wide in terms of the roadway. Uh, we think there's a major improvement there where we'll be going to 26 feet wide. That'll make it much more maneuverable for people getting in and out of those parking spaces as well as the flow of traffic in and out of the site, EVA access, things like that. So I think that the net net is that we get a substantial improvement in both the roadway as well as the parking conditions. So I'll run through very briefly here my parking calculations. I said 134 required. On site, we're providing 106. We have 44 parking spaces going in as a result of the perpendicular parking on Santero Way. There's an additional 16 spaces in the Depot Way extension, which comes all the way around Depot Way connecting into our project site. And then there are 32 parking spaces that are being provided as part of the smart parking. Net net, there's 198 spaces being provided as a result of this project. <clears throat> uh, if you do the math, if there's 134 required, 198 provided, that's 148 percent of the required parking to serve the project. I think that's a great contribution to the community. Uh, the other two points I wanted to make was actually one other, one other additional point, which is um, we are also, as part of the project, providing an additional community amenity. It's actually the half acre private park that's required to be accessible to the public. It's a quasi-public park. Um, I think that that's going to be a great entrance experience for people coming in to the smart train station. I think it's a great entrance to future development, the balance of the site. I think it's a wonderful contribution. So between, uh, I think, what we hope is going to be a substantial improvement to the parking conditions there, we also get a beautiful park out front. Do you have any questions? Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chambers. Any questions from Council at this point? Actually, for staff, yeah. For staff. If we're ready for staff, sure. I was busy jotting at this. So I have, we have a letter here that was given to us from a resident asking if they would be seeing at least two parking spaces for each of the units and ample guest parking. I'm looking at uh, 74 units, 144 spaces if we had two then for each unit. See, seeing as we have about 198 spaces being added, I have some confidence we're meeting that request and exceeding it? With the total parking provided, that's correct. The actual parking required per the code does not meet that, but the essentially extra parking that the developer is constructing exceeds that. Well, this is kind of, this is the original sin from the first time that the city and the developer and even the fire district, we all 
did our best to put a good project forward, but we wound up with some concerns with parking and with the surprise of the higher adoption of usage of students more than we expected has really made parking a challenge. So I, I think this is, is really good. So I have no questions about that. I, and I'm glad to hear the public's pleased about that. I wanted to ask about um, the, require, the request from Bridge for the 750K up front to help with this. Um, as you mentioned, so the next arena cycle is supposed to be truly hair raising. Uh, and seeing as they usually are, uh, I can only imagine what this is going to look like, but I'm hearing two, three hundred more percent of what we're usually dealing with. So I'd just like a little deeper dive into will we be prepared to deal with that, with this, with what, what did you say, 1.5 mil probably left in, and maybe one mil potentially able to come back from the other fund, from the sewer fund? Yeah, my answer is uh, even with the full fund, I don't know that we'll be prepared to deal with that. Um, I'm going to present about housing in a little while uh, later tonight. Um, it is a whole new world with housing requirements and RENA and the mandates that are coming down from the state. Uh, I don't think anyone's been able to wrap their head around all the things that the state is requiring each jurisdiction to do uh, and what that's going to trigger with regards to RENA and, RENA and, and maybe if cities don't meet those requirements. Um, so I, I'm, I can't give you a... So this is kind of like the same problem with the Black House. This is something new and we don't have a handle. Let's put Reno off the table then since that's too much for anyone to deal with historically and now in the future. Instead, Cal can go back to what we have in the plate. You mentioned we have one small project. If the economy was to stay good for another year or two and something was to take off in the Northern Gateway, are, is there a sense from the staff that we're in a decent position to be able to deal with that with this level of expenditure right now? And I realize there's some variability in there, but. So as of right now, we have uh, 34 residential units that have been approved with the, the project from the previous developer. Uh, another, I think, 45 under construction. Um, and a couple other projects that are, that are interested or in, in process, but nothing that would meet our requirements for arena, I'm sorry, or um, I, I guess I am looking at through the arena lens, no, nothing that would allow us to a mechanism to meet our arena requirements under this cycle. And kind of to your point, one of the things that the state is looking at with regards to how they're going to treat cities based on their arena allocations is did they meet the arena allocation in the previous cycle. So that is something to consider that while the, the funding may not be there to help other things that we do now may further assist. Seeing a little more stick than carrot, aren't we? That's right. That's All exactly right. right. Um, okay, that's good. Yeah, I had a concern about that, and I had a concern that we don't have a final number from Bridge yet in exactly what the mix would be. And I have some a little concern agreeing to a number, I, I, although I feel better about it seeing there seems to be a good sense from staff on this without knowing that. What I'd like to hear about that might help me is you mentioned, we talked about you doing public outreach. Uh, I'd like to hear how that went, what feedback you had, um, how many people you talked to, how the message of what you intend to do was shared, and what you described the project to them, what sort of mix potentially you described to the neighbors and what their reaction was. Sure. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, uh, Brad Wibble and Bridge Housing, I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, I can address that question now. I also have a presentation that is mostly working. Um, However you'd like, it works either but, way but for me. Specifically, you know, we were not surprised when the neighbors asked about parking. Um, so the majority of the meeting was on who we are as an organization, our capabilities as a neighbor, a manager, um, how we manage parking. Um, and we did address the same issues that both uh, Guy and Noah have mentioned, the parking as approved is substantial, um, quite a bit more than a site adjacent to a transit stop, in our experience, would mm -hmm. necessarily require. So we think we're making up for the deficit that exists today, and there's more than enough parking on site that, to accommodate our residential parking demand, and I'll go into some of the reasons why. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll try to be quick about this presentation. But. And that's fine. As long as we can come back to what you, how you describe the project, yeah. what sort of mix of housing, and what the reaction was. And in fact, this presentation is 
exactly what we showed the neighbors. There was a lot Perfect. more. I tried to slim it down um, for this evening's uh, festivities. Um, so yeah, I am going to talk a little bit about who we are. I'll talk about the project, and I'll try to address the questions. Uh, so we are San Francisco-based. We've been around um, about 35 years. Um, I have the wrong show up. Yes, I apologize for that. <coughs> I, we tried to load this before the meeting, but I'll see if I can access it now. Maybe I need a little help from staff, perhaps. I should just close out of that. I see you, you loaded two of them on there, and that's why I'm uh, struggling just a little bit. Now we have the right one. I apologize for that. So we are a developer, owner, manager. We're a long-term owner. In 35 years, we have built 110 buildings, and we've only sold two. So our plan when we enter a neighborhood is to introduce ourselves to elected officials and neighbors and let them know what our plans are and commitments that we're making today you know have to be carried out by our management company ultimately so we take pride in the developments that we build the physical plant but the secret to bridges existence frankly is the management company that's the 24 7 365 execution and you all had a chance to see a little bit of that uh, at a, a couple of properties we visited and, and um, you know, Bridge is financially quite strong. We have this S&P rating, which is unusual for a nonprofit. Um, and we have a real focus on transit-oriented development. So I know solar was discussed, and we put that in the larger bucket of sustainability. And the most sustainable thing we're doing here is to build next to this train station and hopefully get people out of their cars for some portion of their trips. Um, a few examples of some transit-oriented work that is completed or underway in Oakland and San Francisco and San Diego. And we really like the, the station stop here at Patati. A uh, big topic with the neighbors was workforce housing. Um, what is workforce housing? And a couple definitions here that I've, I've shown, and I have a lot more detail that I'll go into in just a few minutes. The other thing we did was look at the demographics and the market in Katati. Um, part of the reason the Colon Group isn't building a market rate apartment project here is construction costs have overtaken rents, as it turns out. So they were, this is my interpretation, they, there wasn't capital that would come in and build housing, in part because of where the rents are here in Katati. In our case, we want to know where market rents are because we want to approach those, but we don't want to take a whole lot of market risk. And by looking at who lives in Katati and what their incomes are, we think we've designed a project and a unit mix that matches who lives here in town, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. These are just some more metrics about Katati, which you all are quite familiar with, but as out-of-town folks who've built in Santa Rosa, built in Marin, we wanted to, to look more carefully at Katati. Specifically, the project, 74 units in three-story buildings. There is a small amount of commercial space adjacent to the the smart train, as we've discussed, and some of the amenities, the parking, the park itself, uh, are also part of that. So just to remind you, this was the project that was approved by this body. We're proposing to build exactly the same project. Here's the neighborhood discussion, uh, parking, parking, and parking. We did hear about some of the thoughts of the neighbors as to why that parking was, was uh, problematic. We know there are students there. Um, there's not a lot of enforcement by the HOA. There's obviously overflow parking from the smart patrons because it's free and they'll drive several miles apparently to save a dollar. We think that with the city, we've committed to a, a more comprehensive kind of parking management plan. That's one of the conditions of approval that we will be complying with and maybe going a little beyond that. I won't dredge up the parking again, but, but I, I Suffice it to say, I agree with the, the numbers that were discussed here just a few minutes ago. And I think in this slide you can see where that new off-street parking exists, both the, the overflow for the smart train 
as well as off-street parking and on-street parking. So it is sizable. The park itself, very unusual amenity. Um, we think it's a nice oasis uh, in a, what is going to be, as it's fully developed, a, a fairly urban part of Katabi. Um, the parking management plan that's referenced here, um, that is something that we are familiar with. As a large apartment owner, we're actually quite good at managing parking. Our residents have to show proof of insurance. They get a parking sticker. Our on-site manager knows who's, who lives in the building. They know who, what cars belong in the building. Um, and the particular challenge here will be managing parking of the smart train commuters. And we do own a lot of transit-oriented buildings, so I think we're um, sensitized to that and we understand how to deal with that. We will satisfy your arena goals through 2022. In fact, we'll exceed them substantially. Um, the discussion of students was a big topic the other night when we met with the neighbors. Within a project like this, there will be some tax credit financing that, that, that goes into this project. Um, the IRS, by definition, within the, the code, does not allow the traditional student to actually be a resident in this housing. So if you're a dependent on your parents' tax return, you're a full-time student, you're literally not allowed to live here. If you're returning to, to school, adult student, working part-time or working full-time school part-time, of course those folks are uh, available, but we won't have the situation that exists over there now with multiple students living in a house bringing multiple cars that was supposedly parked for two. Here's the proposed bedroom mix and unit mix that we have uh, in our pro forma right now. This is what we've, we've uh, come to with city staff in you know, concert with their arena goals and our own goals for need for financing to be competitive. This is subject to some change, but I know that we're conditioned, um, should you um, grant the request tonight, that we would in fact at a minimum meet the arena goals for 2022, and I'm, I'm quite certain we'll exceed those. Just to give folks a, a sense of, of the, the rents that transfer through this project, you know, at the low end, $900 a month, at the high end, $2,200 a month. I would say the vast majority of these um, rents are probably closer to that middle number at $1,400. Just another um, attempt to uh, show the distribution of those rents. Um, we are talking with staff about a live-work preference. This is something we've done in many other cities. It's a complicated analysis that we have to do to stay on the right side of fair housing. We have not begun that work yet, but that is our intent, and we fully expect to have a live-work preference here for folks who either live here or work here. Um, school district has shown a, a, a sincere and con continued interest in the project. I know that they're struggling to attract and retain their teachers and that they're certainly within our, the band of folks that we're, we're aiming to serve here. Uh, we do have internally to bridge a really fascinating scholarship program with all of our residents and it's been a, it's been a pleasure to serve on a, a judging panel that gets to see these incredible applications, both young people, people returning to school, um, as well as seniors that are, that are continuing their education. And finally, the request, we are requesting $750,000 from the city's housing fund. I think the staff report called it a grant. We would propose that it be a loan. It's a very low interest loan subject to cash flow only. This is a common structure in our business. Um, and I won't go into all the nuances to why that's beneficial to us, but it will be beneficial to you. It will be paid off over the life of the project, in this case, 55 years. Um, I think that would be the right regulatory agreement that we would be living to. Finally, um, this really is seed capital. We're going to leverage this many, many times over, first at the county and ultimately at the state. There's an application in March that we're um, uh, talking with CalHFA about and structuring this project to be competitive. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that I didn't get to or uh, address any other concerns you might have. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Brad. Um, any questions from council members at this point? No, uh, just a couple. Are you ready? I am. Okay, fire away. How'd you come up with 750? Uh, to be quite honest, I asked for more. Uh, 
but I, I did hear something about that. The thing. staff uh, was had a, a, a broader view of Katati than I have. My view was trying to get this project financed and built, and obviously they're looking toward the future and, and larger arena goals. So um, we think this is um, a great show of support, and it will go a long way as we go to the county and cajole even more money out of them. It shows the local commitment. and. And just to be direct, local money to build workforce housing in, in California, it, it just flat out requires subsidy. And the local agency is virtually always um, expected to show some level of support. Um, we think this is significant. And we will, as I say, leverage this. And if you were to get the approval or the extension at this particular time, um, as things went according to Hoyle, when would you anticipate potentially breaking ground? Well, we think we'll be breaking ground in uh, 2020. So um, funding applications in March, the planets align, um, you know, we're, we'll be in position to do that later, probably fourth quarter. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you for those questions. Councilmember Landman? I always save the vice mayor for last. Okay, good. I like that. Uh, so getting back to, in terms of meeting with uh, the residents in Santero in the area, what sort of attendance, you had one meeting, what sort of attendance did you get roughly? Heavy, light, uh, moderate? It was a, I think we all fit pretty comfortably in uh, the, the Katati room that we were in? Uh, police station's conference, police station's conference okay. room. Um, was there distribution of this through the HOA and through the HOA email system yes. afterwards? Yes. And so we attracted the folks that we could. Um, right. It was relatively lightly attended, I would say. Okay. And most of the concern was parking from these from the residents. Yeah. Okay. And lastly, um, if we were to, uh, if this is passed tonight during this negotiation phase, we'd be okay for you to negotiate with staff. Continue to negotiate with staff. Would you be willing to continue to outreach and update uh, the HOA up till the next meeting in two weeks so they're informed and we do our absolute best to outreach on what we're doing here? Sure. Knowing that even though you've done the message once, we know that sometimes to reach everybody, you have to send it out multiple times, it seems. Uh, we'd be happy to do that. We're hoping that some of those folks are, are hearing about the project here tonight. Good. Okay. Thank you. That, I had one question for staff, if I might. Please. Um, I might have misapprehended this. I wasn't aware if we have excess arena numbers this year, are they indeed rollable as credits? That's an excellent question. So staff, uh, I'm going to touch on this in my uh, couple more presentations from now. But staff uh, is intended to plug in with HCD and ABAG. Uh, they're right now developing the arena methodology, so how that's going to be done. I've heard some rumors that they are considering penalizing cities who do not meet the arena, rolling over whatever's remaining into the next cycle in addition to the two and, or 300 percent increase. Uh, it is absolutely my intent, one of the reasons why I want to attend these methodology meetings is to stress the importance of, as you mentioned, both the carrot and the stick. So uh, if you're going to penalize us for not meeting RENA this cycle, please also give us credit for meeting or exceeding RENA this cycle towards the next cycle. And some of the arguments about that will be, you know, right now we have a good economic, uh, there's a lot of uh, positive economy right now. If we hit the next arena cycle right as we're in a recession, we don't know how long that's going to last. We don't know what the development's going to be. Um, but there's concern that some jurisdictions may try to pump the brakes on projects now in order to stall them out until the next cycle. Certainly. But if that happened at the same time as a recession, then maybe if they're trying to get housing built, give us credit for building housing now, even especially if we exceed what they've said is our allocation. That's my intent. There is no commitment for that as of right now. Certainly. Well, I, I was hopeful for a minute. It certainly sounded good to me. I like the idea. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. And Vice Mayor Skillman? Uh, uh, no, I don't have any questions right now, so I'll save for comments. All right. Very good. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and open this up for public comment. And yes, Ms. Alderman. Um. I'm very generally in favor of all this. I think it's a long time coming that they get $750,000. Um, Mr. Colvin's long suffered. They probably paid that in um, 
park in lieu and everything and it got spelled sent elsewhere in the city so this is sort of sending money back to them and we've been sitting on this three million dollars total but for like seven years now so it's good so i'm all for it a couple things how would the they enforce no student housing barely without that and the other thing is rota park smart is pay parking and katati is free so people come over from rota park to the katati smart station is there a way the city could work to i don't know put in paid parking so it's we don't get the rota park overload and if that could be worked with the developer thank you are you saying you want to send people from rota park back to their city is that what i'm hearing okay i just wanted to double check on that uh anyone else on public comment mr barich council this may be uh quite obvious uh i try to use this microphone as best i can knowing how these principles work but i do want to remind you when you pull the table out here for a laptop and you speak from back here it changes the dynamics a little bit and i have a pretty strong voice so please keep that in mind and i need another solution when you pull the pull that drawer out i'd like to speak about the meeting with the residents of santero way at the community room within the police department uh, I find it humorous that the council would ask the developer his assessment of the meeting and a report of how, what the residents concerns were I think it's laughable I'm surprised anybody up here even asked that question would it be too much trouble when those meetings go on that somebody would bring a little video recorder along and videotape those meetings that are so important to the council to hear what was said there and answer Mr. Lambin's concerns that you can go back and watch it afterwards? Kind of a novel idea. We've only been doing video for 40, 50 years now on the consumer end. Now, it was some 15 years ago, take your leave or take a, a year, that we sat, the citizens sat in this room and watched the city council look over the Santero Way project for the first time. And it was council member Pat Gilardi who sat there and said at the end of the presentation she had a concern and she said, you know, I would really like to see the retail portion of this project completed first before the residential. Because oftentimes it's human nature that these developers put in the residential, then they high, high, uh, take it out of Katati and uh, leave the residential for someone else down the road or it doesn't get completed at all. I'll never forget that. She was right about that. But that's a, that's a common ploy of developers. To go where the milk and honey is first and then the, the difficult retail they leave at the end or they negate it altogether after they get all your approv approvals. That's been 15 years ago. Now, I didn't hear anything tonight about the photophotaic element of this project. We don't see any carports with photophotaic panels or anything discussed. Now, if it's on the plans, I'd sure like to hear about it. Since we're so concerned with photophotaic, which is a great idea on parking structures and, or parking lots, um, that might be something that would concern the council so you can be, try to be consistent. All right, thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this topic? All right, seeing no one, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public comment period for this and bring it back to council for further discussion and some kind of action. And uh, th there was a question about um, students and how, do we, how would it be enforced of, and I thought I heard Brad say something to the effect that it's, uh, for lack of a better word, contrary to IRS codes. Now, still somebody needs to manage and, and check that, but I just wanted to know if you could repeat that. Yeah, happy to address it. So yeah, every household um, 
has to list the residents of the household on the lease. All their incomes are um, incorporated, and a student is a question that's asked. So um, we know upon move-in and annually upon recertification who's living in the building. We um, pride ourselves on the compliance aspect of this. This is a very successful program because it's run privately, but we all have the IRS looking over our shoulder, so this is not a, an area of, of concern to us, and, and I hope I can assuage concerns of the neighborhood that that is not a part of the program. And it's, and, it's well and known. I, it's a, if, you know, to just Google it, it's... But clearly you've, you've done this in other yeah. buildings and projects that you guys manage and operate, correct? Yeah, and we built directly adjacent to Cal State campuses and other things where it was more of a potential issue, kind of the way we're, we've got some proximity to Sonoma State here. So I don't perceive the issue. Do you mind if I answer one other question that came Please. up? Please. Just, yeah. of course, in, interrupt staff maybe, but... The project was conditioned on 20% photovoltaic. So, yeah, we did not highlight all of the conditions of approval here, but our goal would be to utilize that to run the house electric. Most of these systems are designed for that in an apartment building. Um, um, and to preempt any other questions, we don't typically have battery backup, but we are studying that technology, and we may get there eventually. Great. Thank you very much for that. So any... Um any further questions or discussion, well, I was, Vice Mayor? Yeah, I, and I was just going to clarify, too, that the project's already been approved. We're just looking tonight at extending it, so that's why there was not any discussion about the details, because we've already seen them and approved them. So, um, And then uh, also to clarify, too, because I think you, you may have mentioned this, but to highlight it, um, you have a full-time manager living on the property as well, um, who gets to, and that was one of the things that really impressed me when we did the the walkthrough and, and meeting the the manager of the property. You get to know everybody. You see people coming and going. So I mean, you're going to be able to see. Wait, you've got eight people going into that two bedroom apartment. You know, I mean, it, it really is much better monitored than it would be if it was not um, a workforce living arrangement. So I just wanted to highlight that for the public. And, and I do want to reiterate. Um, Tonight, we are not taking action on granting the extension, correct? But we are taking action uh, one way or the other on the um, affordable housing fund. So that's the one thing we are taking action on. The next one will be at our next meeting. Yeah. Okay. House Member Landman, any? Yeah, I'd be happy to make a motion in a second. I'm just going to say, I, after asking all those hopefully not too tough questions, I will say I was very impressed with the bridge projects the management, how they're run, how they're maintained, the staff, the whole organization impressed me in my experience. Uh, recognize the need for housing for working folks. Uh, and I certainly recognize the benefits of this well-designed project. We've watched this project be designed for years, and it is a good project. I, if it can work in the community, I'd like to see it go forward. So, And I'm not lost in the benefits of the parking. I think that was one of the first things all of us asked for. So with that, at least a first step tonight, I'd like to move that we authorize uh, the city manager to negotiate an affordable housing agreement with Bridge Housing and grant $750,000 from the city's in lieu inclusionary housing fund to accomplish that. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further? Staff would suggest it, it be modified to clarify that it's not a grant from the from the fund, but maybe allocation and then the, the specific financing will be negotiated by the city manager. So noted. Very good. No, I was just going to make a, uh, another additional comment. I did happen to go to the uh, Sacramento location mm -hmm. of bridge housing at the Rayleigh Field, and um, they did not know why I was coming. I was kind of unannounced and came in, and um, you would not know that it was any sort of affordable housing based on the housing complex right next to it. And many of the people that I talked to that live in that vicinity of Sacramento had no idea that it was an affordable housing complex. They would just, just assume that it was condominiums. So um, that would be great kudos to, to Bridge and what you guys are doing on that. Very good. Thank you for adding that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the table um, with the editorial. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension? Please show 401 on that vote. And thank you all for being here in your presentations. And we are now at item 10C, which is now. 
Okay. Okay, we're going to take a step back and we're going to take a six minute break. going to reconvene. Thank you for that break. We're on item 10C, which is the 2019 California Building Code Ordinance Update. It's the Noah House show. Thank you, tonight. Mayor Della. So yes, indeed. The council. Uh, yeah, as mentioned, this is the uh, an ordinance to adopt the uh, 2019 California Building Update. The council will recall uh, two weeks ago we had a informational presentation by our in-house expert uh, to give the council kind of the, the more of the details on it, so I plan on keeping this relatively high level, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a first reading to implement the 2019 Building Code. It also includes several local amendments. Um, the uh, Building Code is amended every three years, as uh, Building Official Whitaker identified. It's adopted by the state in July and gives cities and counties six months to implement it locally. Um, generally, the code has been pushing towards energy efficiency uh, in all areas, water use, electricity, all of these things. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, but the most significant change uh, in the energy reductions are going to result in a requirement for most single-family homes to, to install solar panels. So that is going to be a mandate. It's coming from the state. It's being incorporated into our building code. Um, uh, for single family, it doesn't pass through to multifamily, but generally all buildings are going to be required to be more efficient in all of their use of energy, natural gas, and water. So it, it is the direction that the city is, or the county is moving, sorry, the state is moving, and we are uh, implementing the direction. Uh, in addition to that, um, there's several local amendments that are proposed, uh, one of which is the Cal Green Tier 1. So we are leveling up one level from the standard 2019 building code to Cal Green Tier 1. Uh, in addition, we're adopting the uh, grading appendices, property maintenance code, and some additional uh, appendices ref recommended or requested by the Rancho Cotati Fire Protection District who uh, help implement our fire regulations here in the city. Um, Formally, we're also proposing to formally adopt the International Code Council Building Valuation Table. Um, our fees are based on construction value. However, we, don't, we haven't formally adopted what is the industry standard that references building valuation or construction cost values. Uh, and so we are including that into this adoption, which will help uh, kind of standardize our fees and be consistent with all the other jurisdictions. Um, it doesn't actually affect the fee itself. It just gives us a tool as to how we are uh, assessing that fee. Uh, that's essentially what is proposed. Uh, there's a lot of nuances and, and specific elements in the building code that were discussed by Mr. Whitaker uh, last week and are identified in the ordinance before the council. But with that, it's recommended that the council introduce and conduct the first reading of the ordinance to adopt the 2019 California Building Code as amended by the City of Katati and the Rancho Adobe Fire Protection District and the second reading of this ordinance will be proposed on November 12th, 2019. Uh, and then it goes into effect 30 days after that second reading, which meets the January 1st deadline that the state has given us. So with that, I'm available to answer any questions. Uh, that concludes my presentation. All right, very good, thank you. Any questions, uh, Councilmember Moore? No. Councilmember Landman, any questions for staff? Vice Mayor? No. All right, that was really quick. I'm gonna go ahead and open this up for public comment if anybody has any and nobody does. So I will close the public comment and bring this back to council for action. Well, Mr. Mayor, I can see this is controversial, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and move uh, <laughs> the first reading of this ordinance, which proposes to update the California Building Code as implemented by the city of Katari, including several local amendments and the adoption of the International Code International Code Council Building Valuation Data Table to assist with the established permit fees based on the building valuation, inclusive of a two-time multiplier as identified within. Well, second. Thank you very much for that action item. And any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Please show a 401 vote on that. Thank you all very much. And we'll move to our regular agenda items. And the first item A, is acceptance of the fiscal year 2020-2024 Pavement Preservation Capital Improvement Program. Thank you, Mayor. So we have to give Noah a break for a minute yeah, <laughs> while he drinks a glass of water, and then we'll bring him back on. Excellent. I believe it's trial by fire. Right. 
Mr. Scott, it's all yours. Mayor, members of the council, not Noah Horse. <laughs> uh, uh, now, Craig Scott, City Public Works Director and City Engineer. Um, this item is the five-year pavement preservation CIP, Capital Improvement Program, and um, uh, it's, it's focusing, it's not the citywide CIP, it's just focusing on uh, the objective of preserving our roadways. So it's very focused. And uh, just the first slide here is the outline of the presentation, um, beginning with the purpose, scope of the scope of the pavement preservation CIP, uh, describing the methodology, and then presenting the CIP itself, uh, followed by next steps, and then finally the recommendation. The purpose, uh, the the. This ties into the city's uh, financial principles and policy, which states the city will develop and maintain a capital improvement program to be updated annually in conjunction with the operating budget. The CIP should reflect current and changing needs of the community as well as enhance the city community's quality of life. And um, we're chunking it down here for everybody's benefit instead of, um, um, you know, the, the, the citywide CIP, which will be a, another item at a future date, is comprised of, all, of master plans and, and, and this gets rolled into it. And so it's more palatable to, to bring these forward sort of ahead of time. And then it's less uh, you know, weighty to, to come in later on with the citywide CIP. Um, the, so it informs our, our city's annual budget. And then the other tie-in also is with um, the uh, section 65401 of the government code planning and zoning law. And so back on uh, just a couple of weeks ago, October 7th, we brought this before the planning commission for the planning commission in a very focused way to find conformance with the general plan. And so the general plan has a goal um, within its circulation element to create a circulation network that reinforces the desired land use pattern for Katadi and provides for the safe and efficient movement of people and goods to all parts of the city and then an objective that supports that goal uh, talks to maintaining that roadway, which is pretty pretty apparent, you know, self-evident. Um, okay, the scope, moving on to the scope of this CIP, um, it, again, it's to preserve prioritizes projects to preserve the existing roadways and the pavement CIP is to be folded into the citywide uh, CIP which addresses enhancements to the city circulation network. So um, again, it's important that when we're looking at adding traffic signals or pedestrian pathways, uh, additional bicycle lanes, you know, enhancing the system is topic for another day. That, that's going to be, uh, we'll see, bring in those aspects of the roadway circulation network um, as part of the citywide CIP. This is again focused on the, um, you know, the, the preserving the pavement. Um, there, to, to the extent where it, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it makes sense, we'll, we'll bring, we'll, we do look at the, the bike ped master plan and uh, for example, this past project, we did add some stenciling to where the bike lanes share the roadway. And so there's, there's sharrows, um, and there's a picture later on in the presentation of what those look like. But those were brought in along Benson Lane, Loretto, up, up Lincoln, and, and um, they were just sort of folded into that project because it was convenient. Uh, so that does happen where we do add enhancements. Okay, so um, the city has uh, over 150 segments, okay? And so, and it lends itself to a very scientific, systematic process to optimize city funding to uh, achieve the biggest bang for the buck. Um, the state recognizes this, and so statewide it has um, created this, this, this standardization where it requires each city every two years 
to complete a pavement management program and that involves have having someone go in and visually inspect each one of these segments and then rank them or, or give it a score um, pavement condition index PCI and uh, um, update this model which is called Street Saver and it's a model of all of these networks and um, through different criteria pre presents uh, um, let's see, um, a prioritized list of, of pavement pro projects and their different techniques you know based on ref to reflect the condition of that roadway so if it's a fairly good roadway um, it, it gets slurry seal fairly cheap inexpensive treatment and if it's a roadway in poorer shape it'll get more expensive treatment so this model um, it factors all that in um, okay so continuing on with the methodology okay we've got 176 segments and 23 miles and uh, the, the PCI which I mentioned is, is a score from 0 to 100 where 0 is is really bad shape basically a dirt road to 100 which is a brand new paved street um, and then the criteria uh, matches those conditions up with different pavement techniques um, and then as you can imagine the costs change over time so um, we have a really good database now because we've been consistently improving our roadways so the most recent project we pull all those uh, bid items out uh, what, the, what those bid items actually cost us and we wrote put that into the model to get really accurate um, current costs um, and then uh, I meant to have a teaser here at the introduction but there is really good news buried into this presentation and it's in the footnote there <laughs> um, uh, we, we were really curious at a staff level um, oh. to know what two and a half million dollars of spending this year and a million last year did to our PCI and we went from 55 to 61 so we broke through that 60 barrier and we're at we're in the good level in the middle of the good level and climbing so that's just very exciting excellent news just by the way yeah, um, yeah. so the I just want to say we agree with you <laughs> I just to make you feel good Busted yeah. odds. yes um, okay so uh, the model also gives us a chance to input the city's priorities you know what what do we how do we want to you know um, slant our efforts and how much money do we want to put in this this effort so there's that uh, how much can the city afford and then we be just because of the condition of the streets and where we're, we're trying to take it we want to re emphasize rehabilitation over preservation we're, we're on our way to preservation but we're not quite there yet and so it'll be another milestone uh, four or five years from now when we're in the mid to upper 60s hopefully um, to, to have much lower spending and ma to maintain the streets so that's the goal and it's an iterative process we we go through see what the model spits out the street saver model and then we go oh we actually these are the priority streets and so we'll change the criteria in the decision tree to turn and and, and we'll, we'll try to, to, to um, get the priority streets and also cluster the project so it's more constructible okay so um, sort of a, the dashboard of our five-year CIP is um, the overarching goal is to improve our PCI over five a five-year period and then target about 1.2 million a year and that's you can see that was the original goal but instead of you know 1.2 million every year it, um, and, and with this different criteria we um, just looked to have like an average of that an annual average so you'll see the first uh, 2020 we have a 2.2 to roughly a million dollars and then 1.5 million 1 1.2 800 you know, 900 thousand so it so it does vary you know um, per year based on these uh, overriding concerns so 
Um, and then um, to the table on the right shows the five years there. Uh, if 2019 was on the table, and I just want to emphasize this again, that number on the far right would be 61 PCI. And then we anticipate if we move forward with the construction project next summer that we would get it up to 64 and on down the road so that by the end we're at 67 PSI approaching the 70 mark. Now, um, what's, what's important to, to factor in is every year it degrades. So by the time we get to constructing it next year, that 61 will be a 60. You know, just natural, that's another thing that just sort of that natural degradation is built in to the process. And it gets reported out on a monthly basis um, with these standard uh, monthly reports to, to all the cities. And then every year, a standardized report is presented to the SCTA and to the region, to, to everything. So um, Gatati is, is looking to, the city is looking to climb up the ranks as, you know, that's what our expectation is on these, on these reports. And of course the one in the middle there is just if we hadn't, hadn't have done anything. So we, we are making significant progress. Okay, now into the CIP. I, I should mention to the public, the, the PowerPoint is, is available at the, the door there at the entrance. Um, and uh, in the packet, starting on page um, 441, we've got the, the list of the roadways. And then uh, prior to that, there's uh, the, these, these graphics here, these figures. So there's, there's five years. Um, the first year, we're emphasizing the hub streets, as you can see there in West Sierra. The color coding um, is that blue reflects the, um, the different pavement treatments. So red is full depth reclamation, which is what we just saw um, in the L section. That's where they, they churn up the the soil will get it to look pretty much like a dirt road and, and rebuild it. And so we'll, we're seeing the hub streets there, uh, Arthur Street, La Plaza, West Sierra Avenue, um, uh, getting FDR treatment. And then once you get down to West Sierra, it's more a um, edge grind and an overlay which is what we saw north of the railway tracks on East Katati, where they, they grind down the roadway and then put a pretty hefty three inch, at least, overlay of asphalt on there. So it ends up to be a, a pretty uh, good looking road. Um, there's a little sliver there, that's Valparaiso, the real rough section of Valparaiso there, and that's looking to get FDR treatment on the year one as well. There is a section of um, La Plaza between Old Red and um, East Katati that is uh, a, thin, a thinner overlay treatment. So there's three type, three different over uh, treatments in this first project. But you can see um, it's all together clustered so the contractor can really centralize their operations and we could, we could get some cost savings there. All right, so the year two, so that last one is, is looking to start next summer, and then in 2021, the following summer, we're going, proposing to go to the west side of town um, with, with uh, West School Street, West Katati Avenue, and um, with FDR. And on the other, we, it's, it's, there's some green on the right side of the screen. You see some light green, and that is Eucalyptus, Lancaster, some of Old Redwood High, Highway, Primero Court, and West Cat um, and, and Primero Court on that side. It's a little hard to pick up in that screen. Okay. Okay, year three. 
right, so we've got, um, this is 2022, John Roberts um, Drive, Old Red Road Highway, Myrtle Avenue is a long stretch there. <coughs> and um, then there are roadways off of Myrtle, so Geary Way, Eagle Drive, Flamingo Road, um, many of those roads back in there are looking to get um, slurry seal relatively inexpensive treatment. So there's overlay, slurry seal, and FDR. This is a real mixed bag this year. But again, they're, they're clustered together. Okay, year four, 2023, we have um, Cyper, basically Cypress and a rescue. total cost there of uh, close to $900,000. And if it's all FDR treated. Uh, moving along to year five, which is uh, the summer of 2024, we're, we're seeing now, you know, more slurry seals as we're just seeing the benefits of getting to all the, the fixing the, the worst streets. Um, there is Redwood Drive here where we have some FDR and some overlay. Um, but most of the mileage here would be the slurry seals. And then, um, so this is a kind of a snapshot where we're looking at it. I, I don't want you to think that, oh, it's another five, six years before we see this again. This is um, what, what staff kind of the expectation we're putting out there is this would be on the same cycle as the mandated two-year pavement management program that the state, state makes us do. Um, and then the citywide CIP would, this would show up in there on an annual basis. But as far as this comprehensive, um, you know, running all these model scenarios and, and um, looking at re-deriving our five-year CIP, we're looking at doing that every, every other year. But you'll have many opportunities. You'll have opportunities every year, every two years for the more comprehensive look at it to, to revisit this. So this is, um, and, and certainly, uh, this is this didn't happen this year. We stuck we stuck with our plan. But the, the prior year, 2018, um, because of budget reasons, we weren't able to do the full project, and so this thing necessarily kind of morphs and changes over time. If, if for budget reasons we have to scale back the project, then that means the next project gets a little more added to it, but then, so it, you know, just naturally changes because um, we can't, you know, we can try to stick with it every year, but things happen and then we vary from it just slightly. Um, okay, so, so Next steps, we're looking uh, at council adopting the CIP, and then um, we would come back at a future time, um, could be in December or January, with the citywide CIP. The citywide CIP has the parks master plan rolled into it, the streets enhancement, it has stormwater, water, sewer, um, the building, improvements and everything else. So it's, it's going to take us, you know, we, we're, we're well along our way to, to getting that to a state where we can present it, but we're looking at probably uh, early January meeting, and that's when you'll see these, these elements come before you once again. Um, and that concludes the recommendation, um, which is again to adopt by motion or to, uh, yeah, uh, by motion, accept the fiscal year 2024 Pavement Preservation Capital Improvements Program. At this time, I'd be happy to respond to any questions you might have. All right, great. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. Um, any questions for staff? Councilmember Moore. I do not. Have no? All right. Vice Mayor Skillman, just to mix it up. No, thank you. No questions. All right. Council I'd like to keep us on our toes. Just one quick one. 
So you had me at 61. That was that was nicely rolled out. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going. I can't stop smiling about that. So let me ask you, just to remind me, because I started trying to remember. I didn't see in the report. It wasn't that many years ago. At one point, we were almost flirting with dropping below, I believe, 50 into the 40s. That was four or five years ago. That, yeah, is yes. my memory correct yes, on that? Yes, we were in the low 50s and, and dropping. Yeah. I'm just going to say that's a very significant improvement. Um, I'm not going to compare it to any other cities or challenge, but I think it's pretty significant and very pleased. I think the end result of this will be very good for the public. Absolutely. All right. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'll open this up for public comment and see if we have anyone who has any comments about maybe West Side Streets. Ms. Alderman. You guys have chosen all the publicly visible streets, but 2021, you forgot Richardson Lane, um, which is already a dirt road and is a zero on the score two years ago. Um, when are those people supposed to wait to 2025? Um, and the thing about this quality of our streets, you're not, t yes, we have a high overall one. We have a big disparity between the west side has a lot of zero to 20s um, skills and then the others. So you're gonna get a higher number, yeah, but you're, not, you're neglecting the west side numbers, not considering that some streets are zero to 20. You need to show, be honest on what this, how you present this. The streets aren't in great, great shape you're, and you're forgetting big things. How many times have I mentioned Richardson Lane is, needs a horse and buggy to get down it and you miss it out of the plan? You don't listen to me. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Barich. I agree with Lori uh, along those lines. It depends on how, who's doing the grading. It's a lot like any educational system or teacher. It depends on who's doing the grading. And I think there is something to be said about the old adage, putting lipstick on a pig. So when you do slurry seal, when you need a more serious pavement uh, upgrade, it can look good, but underneath the slurry seal could be some major problems with the pavement. So I understand what can happen here with the uh, creative uh, language. Now the five-year pavement preservation capital improvement program was what I remember staff telling me was designed so that there would not be any natural things that would change the plan that would that would come up that was the problem with not having the plan in the first first place is that the staff was making decisions on where the resources were going to be spent spent because things changed so we came up with a plan so things wouldn't change now we're hearing that we have a plan, but things may change. So I'm confused about this. You're either going to stick to the plan, and you're going to make sacrifices in other parts of the budget, like fake farms across the street here and other places, and stick with the plan of roads, police, water, sewer, the core issues, the core principles of running a town, and stay with the, the, the plan and forget these natural uh, things that come up that are going to change the plan. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this topic? Seeing no one, I'll go ahead and close the public comment. I want to say one thing though about the, the flexibility part. Um, we had a similar program in the National Park Service looking at buildings. And like at Point Reyes, we had 350 buildings, ranches, historic structures, whatever. Um, and we had a program where you could put in these different values and it spit out, oh, if you're in quadrant one, you're good. If you're in quadrant four, get rid of it. But then there's some reality checks that I'd like to say, I think this is a fine program, but that these programs don't always take into consideration. So I think the flexibility is built in. Let's just say one of the streets that is on a pavement plan for four years out and there's a vehicle accident on there and the street gets carved up by, I think, I think you need that flexibility to then say, hey, you know what, we need to shift things around a little and pay some attention 
to this street because of what just happened, or a water line breaks underneath it, or something like that. So I think I think that's why you have these flexibility is built into these kinds of programs. Um, having said that, I also want to say I met somebody from uh, who lives on West Katati Avenue. She was a toll taker at the Richmond San Rafael Bridge, and I happened to be wearing my uh, polo shirt that said City of Katati Council Member. And I, I was not aware that I was wearing it, right? And I hand her my cash. She goes, hey, you're a council member? I go, oh, boy. <laughs> and she goes, you know, I live on the west side in, in West Katati Avenue, and it needs to get repaved. I go, I think it's on the plan for two years out. Seriously. And she goes, really? She goes, that'd be great. So you just, you know, you kind of never know where you're going to hit a nerve with people. Um, streets are definitely a nerve. But again, I think having the flexibility built in, I think, is, is an important feature uh, for any of these programs because they can spit out a lot of great information, but sometimes there's reality checks that we need to have. All right. Having said that, um, any questions? Or, Council Member Lane? Question maybe more for staff. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So good subject, seeing as in two years we are doing almost all of the west side, and it will be high numbers, and so it's not being forgotten. But Richardson Lane isn't on there. I noticed that as well. I just want to confirm, staff, you, in fact, did not miss that. That was indeed calculated, and it did not qualify to meet this. Is that correct, number one? And number two, trying to force you to doing a non-qualifying project too early at this point in time, would that be cost-saving for the public, or would it cost the public more money? I, I know the understanding of this, but I, I believe, but I want to hear it from you. You're correct. It, it did not make it onto the five-year plan, so it didn't pass muster in, in terms of our criteria uh, with the model. And um, if we were to bring it in, uh, there would be trade-offs. There would be some other um, more cost-effective, um, bigger bang for the buck project that we would have to remove from the CIP to add that in. Um, that stretch of road services, it, it's dead end. It services eight residents. Um, um, so the, when I talk about the biggest bang for the buck, we're looking at roadways that get the most use and, and therefore benefit to the citizenry here. Um, okay. So that all gets factored in. I think as this moves forward, we would, we would um, definitely see roads like including Richardson and the future CIPs. And, I, and I'd like to suggest, I'm sure staff intends to do this anyhow, but obviously there is always the potential for increased funding from roads. That seems to be several things in the offering that might give us a little extra money for local roads. If the potential's there, I would like to suggest some of these outlier projects that are near other projects we're working on, like the west side. If money can be found, extra money can be found, I'd love to see us wrap those into the clustered project, take advantage of the cost effectiveness, and a little logic because they're all clustered like that. So if you, I ask you to be alert to that, but other than that, I'm fully supportive of this. It makes 100% sense to me. Vice Mayor Skimlin, any comments or questions? Um, no, I, we've seen this a lot. It's good to keep seeing it and uh, get reminded of where we are and get updated. So it's great to hear that our numbers are moving in the right direction. So thank you. All right, Council Member Moore, no comments? All right, well then I am looking for a motion to move this forward. I'd move to accept the fiscal year 2020-2024 Pavement Preservation Capital Improvements Program. I'll second that. There's a second, thank you, a motion and second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Please show 401 vote on that. And we will now move on to item 11B which is an informational update on housing trends and efforts, including receipt of $165,000 in SB2 grant funds and the forecast for the 2023 housing element requirements. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, and I will do my best to move through these relatively quickly. Uh, I do have a presentation coming up, but um, just briefly, just given the importance of this topic and uh, kind of some moving targets, I wanted to give an informational update to the Council. Uh, and as I mentioned, I apologize for uh, kind of stacking this agenda with a lot of items, but it, I thought it was pretty critical given where we were. So uh, I'll get going on it. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, 
Um, so an overview, over the last three years, the state legislator has, legislature has adopted numerous housing bills. I did a quick count. Uh, I came up with 44 uh, since 2017, all specifically related to housing. There's uh, some summaries attached. Some are a little bit more polished than others, but they are, uh, every bill that's, that was adopted does include a, a, a brief description of it in the attachments to the staff report. Uh, these affect project review processes. Um, trying to push more housing uh, projects into buy right status, essentially no discretion, no public hearings. Um, they prevent downzoning of parcels. They legitimize uh, inclusionary requirements for rental housing, which is which good for cities like us that have that on our books. Uh, made significant changes to annual reporting requirements um, and the housing element process. I'm going to touch more on that in a little bit. Uh, and uh, also in the re regional housing needs assessment. Uh, so that's the RENA numbers that we were talking about with the other items. Um, and they also, as most people are aware of, uh, the most popular or kind of high flying changes are the changes to the ADU development, streamlining that and, and kind of limiting some of the, the um, ability for cities and jurisdictions to, to prevent or put kind of hurdles in, in front of ADU development. Um, Something that's not as common with changes from the state is they also are creating some more funding sources. Uh, there's a typo in the report. It was 160,000, so I apologize for that. But we did receive approval conditionally for a $160,000 grant under SB2 to help us tackle some of these uh, changes. And so um, that's why I wanted to come before you is just and the and community to let everybody know. And we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is an artist graphic that came out in April of this year, and it's it kind of attempts to. Uh, identify all the various moving pieces that we have to respond to and again you know whether you're a jurisdiction of a million people or 7,000 people you have to j jump through some of these hoops that the state is putting down on us and so uh, I anticipate uh, a lot of uh, work being required frankly of our department of two staff members and so uh, just look forward to things coming forward to you and um, and to the community so we'll go to the next slide uh, some people have characterized this as a housing frenzy, and so uh, I stole this idea from, from a presentation I saw, but I thought it was a pretty good uh, description and apropos to the topic. So some of the general themes, we can go to the next slide. Um, continued emphasis on objective standards and by right, which again t means less local control and public input. Uh, the objective standards is pretty critical, so um, we're going to be looking to create some objective development standards. and. Uh, you know, the council is aware of some of the complaints behind subjective standards, you know, is it required, what does it really mean? Uh, the state's really pushing us to create objective, kind of check the box type standards that if a project complies with all these things then they're going to be deemed complete and deemed approved. Uh, so look for that process. Um, they're putting strings on this grant funding. So again, if we're not meeting arena numbers, if we're not reporting annually, all these types of things, then we may not qualify for certain grants. And so obviously there, it's the carrot and the stick approach that uh, Council Member Landman uh, alluded to earlier. Um, HCD's authority and oversight was significantly increased through these legislative cycles. They now have more teeth to what they do. They have more oversight in, in the process. Um, there's new process for identifying your housing opportunity sites. Uh, that comes out of your housing element. Uh, obviously, there's a real emphasis on homelessness and trying to address some of those issues. And then getting back to, uh, there are some more grant funding uh, choices and options, but those are not guaranteed. And so that's where the question mark there is. Um, diving a little bit deeper in the next slide. Uh, the RENA process was is new and revised. As we also alluded to, the, the allocation we're expecting in the next cycle, which begins in 2023, is 2 to 300% higher than what we were given in this cycle. Um, and there's a new set of criteria for how those are judged. Um, HDD is much more, are more likely to be involved and, and has more authority, as I alluded to. Um, and there's kind of a lot of the elements there, but they're going to be attending ABAG meetings. Uh, they're going to be involved in the, the allocation process, which identifies how individual cities or counties are given their numbers. Um, and so what staff is looking to do is to kind of plug in early with that. They're starting that now. We'd like to spend some time at those meetings with all the other jurisdictions trying to convince them of things like giving us credit if we over build our o arena now. Let's incentivize really getting housing done now and don't penalize us um, or at least give us an option, a carrot and a stick. And so I, uh, in working with the other jurisdictions, have volunteered to be one of the people to try to plug in with that and attend some of those meetings. 
what that does is I have to be down in, in San Francisco or Oakland at some of those meetings and so it's just it's a staff commitment and so that's really why I wanted to uh, get this before the council because um, we'll go to the next slide but um, I'm sorry, this talks about some of the distribution methodology. So obviously they're looking at reducing greenhouse gases, kind of a balance. If you have a lot of low wage jobs, then you need to have some affordable housing that can, that can supply housing for those people. Um, some of the other things, past failure to meet RENA is looking as a criteria as to upping your numbers, which is some of the, uh, the balancing act and the thoughts behind staff's recommendation for the earlier project. You know, it is critical that we meet that, we think, looking forward. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, but so some of the things we're doing, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, is we really plugged in with SCTA and the Community Development Coalition, our commission, I'm sorry, uh, to look at regional approaches. So um, I know this was presented to SCTA uh, recently, and so staff wanted to come to the council and let, it, let them know that this is kind of percolating amongst the local planning uh, bodies as trying to, excuse me, trying to work together to figure out how we can best approach this. Um, we're exploring creation of a sub-region. So what that would mean is uh, if it's just say all of the jurisdiction and Sonoma, jurisdictions in Sonoma County agree to this, we would peel off, peel off from the ABAG process, get our own allocation directly from HCD. Um, and the idea is, is that it may benefit us in that we could set the allocation. So we could set the criteria as to how those numbers are set. I don't think we're going to be able to affect the actual number we're going to get, but maybe we can affect how that those numbers are divvied up amongst the cities or maybe we can uh, get some additional flexibility being able to trade with other jurisdictions maybe if the county develops directly adjacent to us but but we put in some funding or vice versa then we can share credit so we're just looking for as many options as possible um, I don't know that that's going to be a good solution for us yet but I just wanted the council to know that staff is trying to explore all options available um, given that things are really, it's a whole new world. And so um, I went to the APA, the American Planning Association conference in, in, uh, uh, last month and one of the things that came out of it is how, housing and planning are merging even more than they have been. And so um, folks who have been traditional planners are now going to have to be housing experts and vice versa. Transportation is also getting mixed in with that. And so while our processes on some levels are being more streamlined and straightened, from the staff standpoint and kind of answering to the, the state requirements, it's getting a little bit more complicated and complex and we just want to be in front of it as much as we can so we don't get pinned into a, a situation where we're penalized and maybe don't get some grants or something like that. Um, with that, uh, we're hoping to, uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be significant expenditure of staff resources. Uh, I anticipate bringing a lot of ordinances through the Planning Commission and the City Council process to change our regulations to meet the state code. Um, we are having a workshop on October 24th here. I invite all the community to come and participate. I want to basically let them know all of this information and then hear what their main concerns are. Um, let them know that we're moving forward with addressing this. Uh, interestingly, uh, the City Manager shared with me the results of the, the community survey that was done prior to me coming on board with the staff. and. One of the main concerns was the cost of housing. So obviously, you know, I think some of these things are really going to align with the community's interests, but we need to really hear from folks so we know that we're doing it in the right way that, that fits Katati. Um, some of the things we're going to be tackling based on the $160,000 grant are streamlining ADUs, looking at cottage housing, uh, the ability to kind of put smaller units on lots, and then uh, obviously the buy right uh, stuff that's been mandated to us. Um, the formal recommendation on the subregion process I touched on is, is due in February of 2020, so expect to report back from staff, uh, obviously for that hard date, but maybe a check-in even between now and then so we can see how things are going. Uh, and then just looking forward to the budget cycles for 21 and 22, I know we will need some additional funding in order to get our housing element approved and up to date for 2023. So that uh, I think goes to the next slide. That concludes my presentation. Just a recommendation for you all folks to review the information and kind of be ready for a lot to come. And so again, I'm sorry to keep everybody here late, but it was pretty critical to get it out and in front ahead of the housing workshop and also the, the kind of joint work that everybody's doing. No, thank you for that information. Appreciate it. Um, it's 9.57 before we uh, move any further and have any even discussion on this item. I need a motion and a second that we continue this meeting. So moved. Second. 
Okay, motion is second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, we'll move forward. Uh, thank you again, Noah, for that. And um, yeah, I, I, to me, the biggest thing is, you know, if we really, if we're going to reach our arena numbers by 2022 or earlier, and we don't get credit for that, that is like a, that's ridiculous. And I'm wondering, I mean, you have some different strategies in there, which I appreciate. I think they're definitely worth looking into. But who, who ultimately is making those decisions? Is it ABAG or is it the state legislature? So HCD uh, provides a uh, regional allocation to ABAG. So that's for all the Association of Bay Area Government right. bodies. And then ABAG divvies that up amongst the individual counties uh, and, and jurisdiction within those counties. Hmm. So it's kind of a combination. Right now they're looking at the methodology for how that gets done, which is why we think it's critical to plug in early and now to try to influence that. Right, yeah. I just I didn't know if there was um, legislators at whatever level that, you know, maybe could use a nudge by saying, you know, boy, it'd be really important for cities who are doing the right thing and trying to meet these numbers and they're meeting them. And if they indeed meet them or surpass them, that they at least get some credit for them when the new numbers come out. So sure. I don't know. I don't know if there are, who that would be, but if there are specific people out there, you know, we could draft a letter and send something out like that. Right. Um, any questions or comments for Mr. Housh? No, no, and no. You look like you have something to say. Really? Okay. All right. Surprisingly, no. Very good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open this up for public comment. If people have any comments on this topic, nobody wants to look at me, so I'm going to take that as a no. And again, thank you for that report. And we will move on to item 12, which is the city manager's report. Thank you, mayor, members of the council. So um, uh, just a couple things to touch on. Uh, the PG&E power shut off that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, and we, it was a couple weeks ago now, I guess, that um, they did their first one in Sonoma County our first significant one in Sonoma County. They are looking at doing another one um, again this Wednesday, but it won't affect um, Katati, Katati Runner Park area. It's all kind of northern, eastern Sonoma County. And uh, um, headlines on our website to that effect, so that people, if you're curious, will be able to find that information there. <clears throat> um, as Noah said earlier, we have a housing workshop coming up next week on the 24th. This week. This week, sorry, on the 24th. Um, from six to eight in the council chamber. And so um, if you have any interest in housing, that's a great one to come to. And then um, our, uh, just an update on what our police have been recently doing. They are um, helping the city of Petaluma with their Veterans Day Parade um, actually coming up. And we are assisting on street closures and traffic control with Petaluma PD and other allied law enforcement agencies. It's sort of an ongoing um, cooperative relationship we have with the PDs around us um, where they help us and we help them, um, works out well. And then on um, roadway projects, the intersection changes at Old Redwood Highway and um, East Katahdi Avenue are in place. All the new signage and um, signal, inter signal changes are there. And drivers are alerted to change conditions by the signage, temp temporary signage flags in the, in the uh, changeable message board. And then both pavement projects, this is the, the uh, larger one on in L section, East Katahdi, and um, East Katahdi on the east side of the railroad tracks are um, getting close to done. And um, so we expect to see those finally, finally soon. And then um, on the recreation front next Thursday, we celebrate our third annual um, City Halloween here at City Hall between 1.30 and 5.30. And um, some of the decorations are already going up if you've been in some of the offices. So it'll be another fun year. Children can visit each office for free candy or a goodie and come visit with city staff and, com and um, other community members. This year we'll also um, have displays from Rancho Katati High School, hospitality and recreation students. There'll also be um, Halloween fun at the Veranda Flitty Ranch, so stop by there as well. And um, <laughs> there's, a, I don't know, there's some rivalry going on between um, decorating offices, so you probably see a lot over, up here over the weekend. And then um, we, we also are in the process of planning our annual holiday tree lighting event and are accepting vendor applications and volunteers now. 
And the event will be held on Friday, December 6th from 4 to 8 and expect a full evening of fun there. And then um, that's followed up immediately as um, has been the case the last several years that we have breakfast with Santa on the Saturday on the 14th um, at uh, 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. in the Katati room. And registration is now open, so um, this always has been selling out, so get your spaces now if you are interested in going to that. And then any of this information as well as um, other recreation information and other events are all available on the city website or by, con or by contacting our department, recreation department, um, um, Ashley, primarily at 665-4222 or a Wilson at katadicity.org. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. All right, very good. Any questions for the city manager? Um, have we considered a brunch with Santa versus breakfast? Well, there's two Is sittings. Too early? <laughs> Are there two sittings too? What, what's that? Don't we have two sit sittings too? There's an earlier mm -hmm. breakfast, so we almost have a brunch with the second sitting. It, yeah, it gets close. It gets close. But after two, it's um, I think everyone's wiped out. So <laughs> it's, it's a late breakfast for some, early breakfast for the early risers. So the reply is no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just to be clear. Uh, any questions for the city manager on this way? Okay, thank you. And we'll go to city council member reports and we'll go to my far left and start with council member Landman. And once again, you caught me now. Oh. All right, let's see, we'll try and make this quick. A uh, couple of things from SETA. Uh, first, I'll start by mentioning <clears throat> that the SETA board did vote to support the concept of all electric reach codes and recommend them to communities uh, and cities. Some are looking at this already. Some of the rest of us will probably be looking at it in the future. Some cities are having an exciting time with this. Some are having even a more exciting time with this. So at any rate, I thought I'd share that. It was actually very strongly supported with a unanimous vote of support there, including Supervisor Rabbit. God bless him. Wow. So, uh, and I'll mention then, I want to mention that I should update, SETA has been looking at an extension for Measure M. As many of you know, Measure M is existing sales tax that has financed a lot of road work, most notably the highway project that is now wrapping up within the next two years, but also a lot of local road work. And given the fact that it's leveraged dollars at about a five to one ratio, uh, there's an interest in continuing, particularly because of the amount of work that could go into local, that 40% that went into the highways would be free for other things. So. We did some polling that was put out to see where the public would be on this, and I thought I'd share right now there's a decision point. Should this be simply continuing the existing quarter cent tax, or would it be worth doubling it to do more work, which would be more attractive to the public? Because obviously it's they're going to be their decision on that. Um, and so a few key findings. Overall voters in Sonoma County, this is 600 people, a fairly strong poll, true random selection. It can't be gamed by people, you know, automatically jumping on a website or anything. There are actually, voters are feeling fairly optimistic, which I was pleased to see. Transportation issues are on the top of mind for many, but right now there's a lot of focus on basic economic issues, housing, homelessness. Uh, people are still concerned about traffic co congestion, however, and really feel strongly about the need for improved road maintenance. So I think the direction of our city fits right in there. Uh, Support for the quarter cent sales tax was actually solidly well above the two-thirds threshold. The increase to the half cent was right on the edge, kind of actually did better than I thought. So uh, some components about what people thought were important ranked from the top to least important. Number one thing of the list they were given, repair potholes. Number two, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce traffic congestion on local roads and highways, make local roads and highways safer, Approve evacuation and emergency road access, make walking and bike, biking safer, and enhance transportation for seniors, veterans, and people with disabilities. And I'll point out, I was rather surprised to see the strong showing by reduced greenhouse gases. It got right up there, right below, below potholes, so that was surprising. So as I mentioned, pretty strong, like about 69% of people overall agreed they wanted a modern transportation network in Sonoma County, even if it meant raising taxes. About 30 did not. Give some more information that rose to 75% supporting it. Uh, give a little negative information that dropped back to where it was before. So the bottom line is uh, basically there's some interest in that. I believe the decision will be made at the next ad hoc meeting for the measure in group, uh, but I would suspect given the public interest and some of the straw votes and direction that the board and the ad hoc have given, 
If I was forced to guess, I would guess that the quarter cent might be the direction that we go to, but we'll see about that. Very good. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. I have nothing to report out. Thank you even more. And Council Member Moore. Uh, I helped out at the um, 8th annual Oktoberfest on the 12th, which was very successful. We, uh, the weather held out well. We had a very nice crowd. And I think it will uh, really help with the chamber funding. So that, that was good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I, too, attended the Oktoberfest. And if you ever wanted to hear an Italian speak German, that was your opportunity, because I did. I have no idea what I said, but I looked up something on Google, and God knows how awful that probably was. Did you say you were a, a donut? No, I did not. Okay, just yeah, but thank you. Um, also, last week I attended the League of California Cities uh, annual conference down in Long Beach, along with Councilmember Harvey, um, because I didn't get back till late Friday, and I've been going through this rather heavy agenda. Um, I haven't put all of my notes on paper yet, but I will, and I'll provide it like I did when I went to a conference in Sacramento for the public, so everybody will have an opportunity to take a look at that. And um, also, I can report out briefly, although, you know what, no, I did this, so let's skip that, never mind. Um, but I will say tomorrow, I'm doing something that, um, as an elected, is really kind of cool. I did it the last time I was mayor. There's um, these best practice awards that are given to people that have different disabilities. And I presented to a young man who worked at Safeway somewhere up in Santa Rosa who I believe had epilepsy at the time. Um, very bright, very articulate guy, um, just a great person. And so you know, there's different awards that go to businesses and individuals. So I've been asked and I agreed and I met with uh, the, this individual who works at the Petaluma Pie Company and um, she's deaf. and almost literally everybody in that shop has learned American Sign Language just because of her. And there's like, the, I, I met with the, um, one of the owners and with this young woman and we had an hour and 15 minute conversation. It was incredible. Um, but the owner said that she's bringing like 16 employees. They're closing down the pie store for a few hours on tomorrow morning. And this is at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, so I really need to hurry up and talk, I know, uh, up in Santa Rosa. But it's, it's a really, it's a wonderful feel-good event, so um, I can report more on that at our next meeting. Okay, with that, we're at item 14, public comment on non-action agenda items. Please step right up. Miss Alderman, okay, she had her hand up first. Future agenda items, I'd like to ask for an ethics charge against Mark Lamon. Three times during the presentation, he mentioned Evergreen on the um, assisted living. He did the same thing um, during the Fog City. He should not have, he's the chair of Sonoma Clean Power, and he should not be influencing anything that has contracts with the city. Um, and he did it once again. He even acknowledged he shouldn't be doing it but he does it. Please don't shake your head. Um, I think we should have a fundraiser for um, Richardson Lane, bake sales, anything, because I didn't know a street was, and then Katati can't qualify for when it's a dirt road. Um, the other thing, I think we need to have a study of West Katati Avenue turn um, you, I've talked to many people on Gilman Ranch Road, and they will tell you about the amount of close calls. They'll tell you about the screeching brakes. It is a dangerous turn, and that needs to be addressed before the, anything goes in. Um, homelessness, it's getting cold. Still not nothing happening. You're not making any plans. Weed abatement, are we ever going to deal with it? It's seven years now. You're going to go on to eight years without ever putting it on the agenda because we know you don't put anything on the agenda that you guys don't want to pass unanimously. Um, that's what you've done for five years. So um, other than that, I guess that's it. And oh, oh, one also thing you did not, when you made the motion to go out past 10, you did not ask for public comment. I think that was a brown fat. Like, uh, I don't know if it was a violation, but I apologize for that. 
Mr. Berridge. And we voted on it. I guess it's not. I guess it's not a violation if you say it's not a violation, Mayor. I'd like to speak on a future agenda item. I see tonight on the consent calendar that the city went ahead and spent for the benefit of the public. You're not going to believe this. Seventy-one thousand dollars on a police vehicle for the community service officer who's been probably driving around a little minivan for the last 20 years or so. So the city spent $71,000 to purchase and up, uh, an, uh, an upfit a uh, police vehicle for community police officer. So I have uh, some comments about this. I don't know what you bought. It doesn't say what you bought. Is it a fossil burning vehicle? that maybe Mr. Moore would be concerned about listening to? Was it a hybrid? Was it a fully electrical vehicle? Because it's not in the staff report. So look, going forward, let's, let's think about the value of $71,000 for the community service officer. Um, I brought this issue up some 18 years ago or so when the city was going to was looking at designs of building a new police station our current 21 million dollar police station so a couple of us got up john rock and i and we said look if you're going to build a parking lot in the back for the squad cars we're probably not going to be driving fossil fuel burning uh, uh, police cars in 20 years, maybe we should put uh, a uh, carports out there along the back side of the police station so that it can accommodate photovoltaic panels on the top of the, the carport to support charging the, the p police vehicles in the future, the electric ones. Oh, they didn't want to do that. That was a bad idea. That wasn't going to happen. So I suggested, hey, why don't you just put conduit across the parking lot so that in the future, if we have some electrical vehicles back there, it you won't have to tear up the asphalt. Nope, that was a bad idea. They couldn't do that. So then I look at the plans, and the plan showed a row of redwood trees on the back of the property. I said, please, council, don't put redwood trees there. They're going to grow up, and they're going to cancel any sunlight that are going to hit any photaic panels on the top of the carport that some future city council who's really smart may want to build. Harold Berkemeyer sat there and said, George, I can assure you, there's not going to be any redwood trees back there. Those are all small bushes. Go back there now, there's 40 foot redwood trees back there. There's no chance of getting any sunlight on any carports in the future. So this is, this is a joke. $71,000 for a community service vehicle. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else on this item of public comment on non-action agenda items? Yes, please, come on up. I mean, not it's from lessons learned from the power cycle. So um, I know City of Katati, we didn't get affected up here. City of Pen or Pengrove, we got affected. One of the things that happened was when Comcast lost power, all the batteries in their systems lost power too. I don't know who provides the internet services for the city, but we lost our server. We lost our ability to log in. So we're taking steps to come up with a cellular backup system. So it's something you guys might want to think about. So That's good. After action reviews are always important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. All right. With that, um, did we have any information received after the agenda was posted? And that's a no. Uh, no, um, I, I just want actually want to just mention one thing. Okay. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but um, the uh, the staff report is pretty clear. It's a upfitted police vehicle and a community service vehicles, two vehicles. It's two okay. two vehicles for seventy one thousand, right? No, it's pretty clear in the staff report. It says it multiple times. And might I ask the obvious question that anybody know that had any involvement with all in city business or police? I imagine it has to have a full complement of radios in it, Mr. Obid. That's correct. It's fully upfit. Well, there's your money right there. You, you could get a 1963 Volkswagen and put those radians and about hit that rate. So thank you. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. 
And uh, we're at item 16, which is adjournment at 1017. Thank you all very much.